Good morning and welcome to The Review, the Instagram live podcast where Kanama news, culture, and stories are shared over the warmth of coffee. My name is Adam and I'm your host and today we are privileged to welcome to The Review Vega Shredder, Soul Kanama's team member, anime fanatic, symphony conductor, I don't even know if that's true, but a classical musician nonetheless, Kelvin Wong today. Guys, I am so excited to get Kelvin on here. Kelvin's a big fan of the show, and I am a big fan of Kelvin. Kelvin is an incredible Kanama player that has calculated precision in everything that he does, and it's going to be a task to mine into that today and figure out how do I become a better Kanama player from one of the most consistent, most honed, most practiced Kanama players out there. I remember when I first saw Kelvin was at NAKO 2019, I think, I saw him competing in the top 16 and the way that he would compose himself before every attempt at every trick was just stunning. So I'm very excited to get Kelvin on here and talk with him about both his Kanama play but his other passions, his other hobbies. If you didn't know this about Kelvin, he is a very pronounced musician. I'm very excited to dive into his love for classical music as well as his love for anime. If you didn't know this, Kelvin has a mod with Soul Kanamas in the Vibe lineup that he designed or helped design. This is the Mari, and it's themed after an anime called Evangelion or Neon Genesis Evangelion. And I know nothing about this show, so I need to learn some today from Kelvin, and we'll see if I get convinced to watch it. That's the real task of Kelvin today. On top of that, guys, as always, as we get ready to dive into every week's episode of The Review, I like to take some time to shout out some of our community members by asking, what are you drinking this morning? What are you drinking? Let me know down in the chat. Today, as I was last week, I'm drinking an AeroPress Ethiopian from Analog Coffee. I've really been digging this roast recently, and to be honest, I wasn't always a huge Analog fan. Analog was not my favorite of the Calgary Roasters, but this one in particular is quite good, and I've been really enjoying it. So I've been giving them a lot of love. They've done well, and I'm excited about it. I this this morning myself, and I had to make a decision whether or not I used the Native mug or the Kanama Latte mug, but I chose this one. With all that said, uh, let me know what you're drinking down below and leave any questions that you have for Kelvin down in the Q&A tool. We like to take some time every episode about halfway through and at the end to answer your questions as this is a live conversation. We want to get you guys involved. If you want to have priority questions, make sure that you sign up for the Patreon for only $5 a month American and that gets you behind the scenes access, access into the close friends story and everything else behind the review. So go check it out and we will be diving in right away. But not without shouting out some of our community members. Crispy at 10 FPS is drinking some Dr. Zevia. We got Scuba Chat with some Starbucks in a can. I didn't even know they had Starbucks in a can. Adrian, it be Adrian, says, Oh, I was like, when did we start making coffee? We always were making coffee. We got Dustin A. Nut with the medium roast and Alex Mitchell in the chat to hype up his teammate. And Chad Covington is driving off to Nashville to go get some local coffee. This is fantastic, guys. We are caffeinated and ready to rock an earlier morning today. So let's get Kelvin on here and dive in to the review. Kelvin Wong. What's up? Welcome here, my guy. Good Good morning. Thank you so much. Good morning. (laughs) How are you doing today? I am doing fantastic. I'm Dude. so glad to be on here. I'm so glad you are on here. This is a huge privilege for me. Yeah, I'm, thank you so much. I know that we had briefly met. I know we met at NAKO 2019. I hung out mm-hmm. around the Soul Squad a little bit and definitely was up there near at the front of the stage cheering along with you guys as we were cheering on Liam Router, you, Dude, I think, yeah. Carter. Oh yeah, I was right up there with you guys for the whole time because I was, I was just hanging out with Chad. I was trying to weasel Chad into letting me be a distributor for uh, the Canadian Kanama scene up here for Soul and Sure. Hey, look, look where you're at now. We did it. We did yeah, it. Yeah, we did it. <laughs> <laughs> so I was hanging out with you guys a bunch, and that was such a fun year, but I don't remember if we had met the year prior. Were you at MKO 2018? I was at MKO 2018, yes. I don't remember, like, meeting you at all, but, like, I don't know. That year was just, like, a whole, like, a blur to me. I remember yeah. 20, yeah. Were, were you part of the Soul Team in 2018 when you were at MKO? Yeah, I was part of the Soul Team in 2018. Uh, at that time, like, at that MKO, that was um, when my first vibe released. 
So I just oh. had, so I just had moved up from street team to the flow team. Right, right, right. I remember that. I, oh, I got to pull up your old vibe design. I can't remember what one that was. We'll have to I talk actually, about that. Or do you have it. it? Yeah, I have it right here. Okay, so yeah, give us a little peep on that, and we'll definitely touch on that a little bit later. Yes, that one, dude. That was one yes. of my favorites. That one had such good tracking on it. Dude, thank you. it was one of my favorites too. I'm... Oh. So good. So freaking good. Okay, well, hey, Kelvin, you are a listener of the show. You know how this first part goes down. Mm -hmm. I have a few questions I like to ask every guest. Gives us a little bit of a baseline to go off. And it, I think, you know, I love hearing everybody's different answers. But, Kelvin, what are you drinking this morning? Um, I'm actually drinking milk. I'm actually drinking milk this morning. <laughs> You're just I've... drinking a glass of milk? <laughs> yeah. So, like, I've drinking a glass of milk every morning for – as long as I can remember. It's just what? like, it's just a thing that my mom kind of like instilled in me kind of like, oh, if you drink milk, then you know, uh, you'll grow hard bones, stuff like that. I'm like, <laughs> okay, that's awesome. Yeah. So, so we could we can just wrap this interview up here. We everything if you want to be like Kelvin <laughs> Long, just just drink a glass of milk in the morning. And that's all you got to do. And I will do have, have a little um, like, something coffee inspired. So this is a uh, coffee candy that you can get from like your kind of like local Asian grocer. It's called uh, yeah. It's my favorite brand. It's called, uh, Copico coffee candy. It's like what? It's what like, kind of candy is that though? Like what? What is it? Uh, it's just like coffee candy. So they have like you know coffee candy. They have like cappuccino candy, and it's it's so good. Is it's it a hard candy, candy or a soft candy? Yeah, it's it's a hard candy. Just pop it in your mouth and then, like. I'm impatient sometimes, so I just like bite it down like a mess. Yes. <laughs> are you are you are you uh like a chew your candy or do you let it like slowly deteriorate in your mouth over time uh most of the time i'm a chewer like i like whenever someone has jolly ranchers and like they yeah. get it to me, i like immediately chew it and like my friends look at me like what are you doing yeah i like, know I'm, I'm the same way i'm such an impatient person i'm like okay because okay you're at a you're at a party you got the community bowl of candy and and everybody's trying to you know consume as much as they can. They want to get yeah. the most candy in, right? You're that that's the exactly. goal when you're at a party. And yeah. and all these people wasting their time just sucking on candy. They're missing out on getting more candy. So if you're a chewer and you're a crusher and you're just crushing Jolly Ranchers, you're gonna get more candy out of it in the long run. So you're actually getting more of the more of the flavor. So well, let crushing me ask you this: every, Are you every an time. ice chewer? Like, do you mm. chew ice in drinks? Yes, sometimes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Actually, yeah, no. Definitely. Totally, I do every time. Okay. Yeah, I don't sure. think I ever would would just let the ice melt in my mouth. Yeah, that's, <laughs> oh, that's so weird. <laughs> yeah, dude, people, people, you, you people down in the chat who just suck on your candies. <laughs> what, what are you doing? What are you doing with your lives? That's awesome. So coffee candy, I'll have to pick some of that up. We have like, I don't know if it's the same chain down in the States, but we have TNT, which is like the Asian mm -hmm. supermarket up here in Canada. I don't know if it's the same in the States, but they I bet you they have it. They have yeah, everything. Just, yeah, it's probably in, like, the snack aisle, like, near, like, you know, where all, like, the other, like, sweets and, like, chocolate is. So, like, you should definitely, like, you know, look for it if you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you, uh, do you guys have lots of Asian supermarkets? I had never really been to an Asian supermarket mm -hmm. until this year. One of my roommates, uh, uh, he's Chinese, and he's like, dude, come with me to the TNT. And I was like, okay. So we went to TNT, and it was the most insane experience ever that I've ever been in. It was just so crowded. This is kind of like early COVID where there wasn't many people, and it was fine. But it was just insane. You go in there, and it's like such a like chaotic mess, but everything's so yeah. cheap and affordable. But everybody yeah. knows everything in there. And I'm like, I felt so lost. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't even know what to buy because I can't read anything. And he's like, this is good. This is good. This is good. Get this one. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I just bought things. I didn't know what I was buying. Dude, yeah, for sure. So, like, Vegas is, like, a whole, like, mixing pot and definitely, like, a, a huge part of, like, the grocers here are Asian grocers. So, like, that's kind of, like, I, I've been here for, like, most of my life. So, like, just going to, like, an Asian grocery store after, like, eating, like, uh, dim sum brunch with my family mm. has been, like, a total, like, um, kind of tradition. And it's just, it's like, it, it is hectic in there, but, you know, as a kid, you have like so many experiences that you can relate to like <laughs> like I it was it was just, so yeah. fun though like it was, it is, it was crazy yeah. but so fun mm -hmm, for sure yeah sorry you go ahead i was just affirming that i loved no, 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 it yeah. i wasn't saying it was a bad thing i love <laughs> i love the chaos it's like uh i, I remember like it's like slapping like <laughs> like they have like huge piles like bags of rice and like i just remember like 
slapping them like i like i think other asian kids can relate to that and just you know like you'd see kids running around carefree the parents would just be on their own kind of like you know buying groceries for dinner that mm. night it's just like it's a whole like experience just being in there it's crazy dude i yeah i, I need to go back soon and do some hot mm. pot again hot pot's one of my favorite oh. like asian dishes so good and obviously it's like in Canada or in, in North America, it's like hot pots, like, you know, oh, it's hot pot. It's so exciting. But in China, that's like what everybody is eating every day. That's just like normal yeah. from, from what my roommate was saying. It's like, it's just like what everybody eats. But it's like, it's so good. I want more hot pot in my life. Dude, if you love hot pot, I got to turn you on to like so many other like great Asian cuisines. Oh, send, send me your list afterwards. We'll all Dude, we'll do, we'll a, do. We'll do a little trip to, to TNT's here soon and, and get it done. Okay, mm. Kelvin, uh, second question I want to know is if you could teach any one person their first spike, either past or present, alive or dead, doesn't matter, who would it be? Okay. I thought about this a lot, like, you know, because I, I was listening to, like, a few of the podcasts, mm -hmm. like, on my bike ride to work. I still don't have a concise answer, but like, I don't know, just somebody that keeps on popping up into my mind is either Bruce Lee or Jackie Chan. Ooh. Yeah. They, dude, they would, those are some solid picks. Yeah. I don't even know what they would do if they had a Kendama. They'd be exactly. like Jacob Acrobat in the same way that like, we don't know what Jacob's going to do with a Kendama because he's just an innovator and he's doing th things that we never thought could be done with a Kendama. Same thing with Jackie Chan and Bruce Lee. I'd love to see a, them fight with a Kendama. That's exactly. what I'd want to see. Like, just so hectic. Like, you, you don't know what's going to, like, come from them. Yeah, oh, that, that's a good pick. I like that. I like that pick. Absolutely. Man. Oh, that's a cool one. Now I'm just, like, caught in that headspace of, like, what would Jackie Chan do if he had a Kendama? Exactly. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, uh, who is the most inspiring player to you today? Not of all time, but like just right now in this moment of history for you, who inspires you the most right now? So um, it's a huge, it's a, it's a two-way tie, definitely. But I'm going to have to say Kevin DeSoto, 100%. Like, you know, I, you know, ever since like getting on the team and stuff like that, he's been like super like friendly to me and like lately you know, our friendships kind of like matured and grown a lot. And like, mm -hmm. we hang out like every week and it's just been like so amazing to like hang out with him and like progress with him. And we just have like this dynamic where we can just, you know, kind of joke around and, you know, kind of, you know, roast each other in a way where we just know that like it's out of love, you know? Yeah. The, okay. When did you meet Kevin? Obviously you're both from Vegas. Did you grow up in Vegas? Has it been home for you? Yeah, I, I grew up in Vegas. Um, I was born in, like, Minnesota, actually. But, like, I moved to okay. Vegas at a very young age. So I was there for, like, you know, ever since I was, like, one years old. And so I didn't start Dama until, like, I was in middle school. And I saw Kevin at my first event. It was a local Vegas event called um, Chillin' and Grillin' 2, right? Okay. Okay. And, like, I arrived on the scene, and I was just, like, filled with, like, a rush of just, like, wow, this is, like, a whole other, like, world that I've never seen before. And, like, I recognized Kev from, like, you know, a few videos I saw, and I saw him, and I was, like, yeah, no. Because I was, I was just, <laughs> like, I was super introverted back then, so, like, I didn't have, like, you know... I didn't have the balls to just like, you know, go up and like say like, yeah. hi, my name is Kelvin. Like, I think like, I like kind of walked past him. And I was like, you know, <laughs> hi. And then that, that was it. <laughs> but it's I like, yeah. <laughs> so wait, when you're at events, I, I don't know if you get this much, but I, I remember mm -hmm. just watching it all the time when you're at like NAKO, MKO, mm -hmm. there's like the little kid who will like try and like stand in view of their favorite pro and like yeah. try and hit a trick. And they're like, <laughs> they're really trying their best to hit earth turn or whatever. And Dude. then every time they hit it, they're like, look over to see if, you know, Kevin DeSoto <laughs> saw them or Kelvin Wong saw them. Dude, for You're sure, like, yeah. And look, was, where, was that you at this event? Yeah, that, yeah <laughs> that, that was definitely me. Yeah, I, I can definitely relate to that. And that's awesome. So you, that was where you first met Kevin was at this event. Did you yeah. know who he was beforehand? I I knew who he was. Yeah, I was just like, you know, that's, that's Kevin DeSoto right there. And I was just like, you know... Yeah, maybe another time, you know, because, yeah, 
he was a Vegas late Vegas native, so I yeah. have other chances to like meet him and probably talk to him and stuff. Yeah, he was one of the guys who really kicked off the whole Konami scene in Vegas. One of one of the early guys for sure. Yeah, 100%. I remember talking. Yeah, talked with him a couple weeks back on the review about it and hearing his story is super cool. But so so how did you get into Konami? It was in Vegas where you picked it up. Yeah, it was in Vegas. Okay, um, so like I said, I started Konami when I was in like sixth grade, mm -hmm. and but I wasn't like actually introduced to Konami like until like a few years beforehand. So uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this YouTuber, but uh, this YouTuber name is uh, Niga Higa or like his. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. So he came out with a video called um, Ken Dama Toy, and that was like the first time I've ever seen like. A kendama ever i was like he has a kendama video okay. yeah he, he literally ha he literally has a video called kendama toy it's like insane like he's just like you know it's like a meme video basically but he kind of goes like over like all the basics and that was like my first um kind of introduction to kendama i was like huh i don't remember that but like i i totally wish i like got into kendama back then but it wasn't until uh -huh. like a few years later you know in middle school so um, I was in gym class, and that's when, like, uh, it was around, like, mid to end of 2014, and, like, around that time in Vegas, if you were there, it exploded back then. That was, like, the like one of the peaks yeah. in Vegas. It was absolutely crazy. Like, people were playing it, like, on their way to class. People were playing it at, in, like, in the lunchroom. Specifically me, like, I had gym class, and so many people were playing in gym class. And I was like, oh, I remember that toy. That's Kanama. Mm -hmm. that's stupid i don't want to do that because because like, <laughs> literally like i was like an angsty like you know preteen. i was like i don't want to do what everybody else is doing like i want to be like unique and on my own and stuff but you know i i succumbed to peer pressure and yeah. uh yeah so on november 22nd i got my first kendama after like trying to convince my dad for so long to buy me one and here so, we are. yeah how did it did your dad buy you that one or did you go out? Did you save your own money and buy it yourself? What one did you get? Uh, no, I, I asked him to buy it for me because I, you know, had no concept of, of money back then. So, yeah. Um, it was a, um, it was a Cook's Custom tribute. It was like, you know, it was, um, it's called, it was like pearlized blue. It was like okay. stained, it was like stained blue, like, uh, all like the, the whole down. the whole Ken and Dama. Yeah, it it was it was crazy, and like um, like as you played it, it get more like faded and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And it it was it was around the time where like tribute still had like the gold ring inside like the hold on like with the string hole. They yeah, still had yeah, the yeah. gold ring in there. It was so, a it was a straight yeah. pipe through like it went mm -hmm. through the the Serato and the Ken, and you exactly. would string through that. And you could never fix it because you could, yeah, you can never like take it apart. It was yeah. crazy. It would always wiggle a little bit, and you just get so upset about it that you couldn't yeah, do anything. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, Absolutely. That was, my, that was my first Kanama, so that was crazy. Yeah, that that's awesome. So you picked up this Kanama. What was some of the earliest phases of your Kanama journey? Were you just playing at home? Were you, or did you start engaging in the community right away? Because you were saying that it like blew up in in Vegas, and I know Kevin was talking about that. Where Vegas was like this hot zone for Kanama growth for yeah. Me. Did you just dive right into the community, or were you playing by yourself? Um. So like for the first month or so, I was like you know kind of like just like in a hyperbolic time chamber. Like I was just like you know. By myself like whether it was like upstairs downstairs like on my own just trying to like you know land tricks and it wasn't until like um, a month or two later that's when i went to the event that i met kevin at chilling grill mm -hmm. too and like so after that i um i got third place at that event in intermediate and like after that i just like kind of like dived into the community all together it was like it was mm -hmm. great i whenever whenever there was an event like that i could go to I'd make my way, you know, at that event. But mm -hmm. what sucked is that, um, like, when my both my parents work, so I had to, like, you know, kind of, like, really convince them to be able to drive me. And most of the, like, Kevin lives in uh, North Las Vegas, and I live on the south side. So it'd be pretty hard to, like, get to some of the events sometimes. So it'd take a lot of convincing, but I was able to, like, make my way to, you know, most, most if not, you know, mm -hmm. the majority of the events that they threw. 
And th there were a lot of events in Vegas at that time. So you, you had that privilege where you could just go to a lot of different events in that season because yeah. Vegas isn't that big from my understanding, right? Like it's not that crazy. It's not really that big. Yeah. People like, people think that it's like, you know, like this whole like huge, you know, town, but really it's just like really condensed and just, you know, we have the strip and then like we have like the suburbs and that's it. Yeah, it's super interesting. I, I follow a lot of YouTubers and so many people are beginning to move to Vegas, you know, all these oh. like financial YouTubers and stuff because of the low taxes, yeah. low cost of living, but yet you get all of these other assets and benefits of being in Vegas, the season climate, all that stuff. Like, man, I want to move to Vegas. All my friends are in Vegas. Okay. <laughs> don't, don't even get me started on that because the majority of people moving to Vegas are just Californians. I know it's all the Californians Cal yeah. moving, moving there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm just like, oh, they're such bad drivers, and it's just like you know, <laughs> en encountering them on the street. It's like, oh my god, you Californians, you <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what what makes these Californians such bad drivers? <laughs> it's just like they they just Spill don't the know tea. like they they just don't know how to like communicate like on the mo it's mostly on the freeway and stuff like that. And, you know, the way they drive over there, they're used to, like, all the congestion and stuff. But here, we, like, we normally have, like, free freeways. So, it's just, like, they, they don't know how to, like, <laughs> react to that. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. That's that's what we say about uh, drivers from, from BC when they come to Alberta. <laughs> they have no idea how to drive here. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, man, that's awesome. That That's super cool. Yeah, that's crazy. So you got into Kanama in Vegas. You were in middle school when you picked it up. What were you doing beforehand? Like, who was Kevin, Kelvin before uh, Kanama? Like, what else were you doing? I know that you're really into music and anime, but were those things prevalent in your in your life at that point? Or were you doing other things? Um, What's funny enough is that, like, anime, music, and Kanama kind of fell into my life all at the same time. Like, I've been playing violin the same amount of years I've been playing Kanama. Because mm -hmm. I started playing violin in my orchestra class in sixth grade. So, yeah, around that time, you know, like, I, I've i progressed, you know, the same amount for both of them, which is, like, kind of crazy. But, I like, before that, um, I don't really, like, I, I didn't really have, like, um, any video game consoles. I never had, like, a DS, a Game Boy, I never had a Wii uh xbox or any of that like if mm -hmm. i if i wanted to like i'd have to go over to my neighbor's house in order to like play his wii over there mm -hmm. but other than that like i'd only be able to um ask my parents for like like three main toys pokemon cards bakugan and legos dude heck yeah yeah dude so, i never got into bakugan toys but i remember watching the show it was a crazy show, and I have, like, such a huge collection and just so many, like, random, like, Bob Gumballs just, like, yeah, yeah. lying around the house. Dude, that's awesome. Am I, though, okay, you know the little uh, tangent? So now that, like, my generation is starting to have kids and, you know, my generation's kids are getting, I'm, like, 25, turning 26 yeah. this year. So a lot of these kids are, like, five, six, seven now of, like, my generation. And... I grew up watching Pokemon, Bakugan, and now all of those games are coming back to life today because my generation's kids are playing those games because it's like the parents of my generation are looking at them and like, oh, you got to play my my games that I played when I was like, you got to play Bakugan. <laughs> Dude, I saw that too. It's just like a huge like resurgence of all of them. I'm like, dang, that's crazy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so how did you get into violin? Was that a choice that you wanted or was that something that you were, you were brought into? Was that something part of school? Like how, how did that happen? Violin's really I, peculiar. Yeah. I had like kind of like a vague idea of um, what I wanted to do in like middle school. Like I like, so transitioning from elementary school to middle school, like mm -hmm. I had like, like I had no idea what an elective was. Right. I was just mm -hmm. like, what, what, what is this? What are these words you're speaking? I was like, you know, well, you can choose, like, you know, like, kind of like um, a, a free period to do, kind of just like learn whatever you want. So it's like, there's like art, and music, and just whatever. I was like, huh. Well, like, I I've been like exposed to violin as like ever since I was a kid. I was like, it'd be like really interesting to learn violin. So that's why I kind of like I was attracted to violin at first. Mm. so you you ended up choosing it and you've been playing now for what eight eight years or thereabouts uh, or? this yeah this year is going to be seven years 
Okay, seven years. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. And you're done school now. You've graduated high school, right? I graduate high school in like a few weeks. Okay, so coming up, yeah. I was like, I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure I saw some grad photos or something of you recently. <laughs> but I guess, yeah, your, your school year yeah. goes on a little bit longer. Are you excited to grad? Dude, yeah, I'm just, senior is just hitting hard, <laughs> and I just have, like, no motivation to do any assignments, so I'm just, like, ready to get this over with. Yeah, senioritis is a terrible disease. <laughs> but yeah, what are you, what are you hoping to do next year? So what, what's your plans post-graduation? Um, so I'm enrolled in a local community college um, so that I can get, like, my prereqs done, like, mm -hmm. as, like, cheaply as possible because that's, like, you know, the smartest option. Mm -hmm. And then after that, um, I was like, uh, I kind of want to pursue like a career in graphic design. I don't know exactly what mm -hmm. yet, but um, so I want to kind of go to a design school. I'm choosing, I have like a few places in mind. Like I have like a school in Washington in mind, a school in Georgia, New York, Rhode Island. So I'm, I'm still kind of like researching them right now. So yeah. hopefully I can, yeah. Yeah, that's super cool. Okay, we'll we'll catch up to that moment in history in a little bit. Mm -hmm. So so catch me up through some of your Kanama journey. You've been playing now for about seven years, six, seven years. You picked it yeah. up around the same time as as Kanama. Uh, you went to this event, you met Kevin, you competed, you did really well. You placed third in Intermediate, your very first event, which is yeah. heckin' good. Uh, what what was the journey after that like? And when did it start becoming serious to you where you were like, oh, I, I actually really like this game? Yeah, dude, oh. Okay, I can't wait to talk about this. So, um, I I moved from Vegas to um, Wisconsin for, like, a brief period. I lived in Wisconsin for, like, three years or so. So, like, you know, that kind of transition really you know, impacted my uh, Konama career in, like, a huge way. Like, I was, like, starting to get, like, somewhat decent, in my opinion. Like, mm -hmm. I was able to do, like, you know lunar tray somewhat like uh relatively often and like you know all like the hard um new gen stuff that was you know pretty popular back then i wasn't able to do, do juggle yet but you know that's fine with that like I'll, I'll do that down the road but um so it wasn't until like uh 20 2015 2016 that was like you know a huge like kind of growth spurt for me like i was just like that's when so much Dama content came out around that time. Mm -hmm. And it just like really impacted me in a huge way. And a lot of the edits that came out around that time really like impacted me, like, especially from like a few players that like, I really look up to like Ben Harold, mm -hmm. Wyatt and stuff like that. And, um, that, that was a really interesting year for edits because that yeah. was actually a low point for Konama where Konama had started kind of sliding downhill and it's, mm -hmm. and it's like, broad scope acceptance you know we had that big boom when you would have started and then it kind of started to simmer down pretty quick and then there were yeah. there was that year where sweets can almost sponsored all of their pros like cooper eddie max norcross william penniman and they did their uh that lineup and all the edits and those edits yeah. popped but that was also so weird because a lot of people had already quit playing kanama at that point and it was like the the first step of the return where we started to see it pick up again. So, yeah. and that's that's where a lot of these pros today, like yourself, uh, mm -hmm. really focused on growing was in that season when no one else was playing or when yeah, very dude. few people were. So yeah, yeah, keep going. This is um, so I I went back to Vegas like every like, you know, winter break and summer break or so. And lucky enough, uh, the summer of 2016 was um, the Las Vegas Kanama Open LVKO. It was thrown by, I don't know if, like, uh, it was thrown by the, the Crystal Ball family. They were, like, you know, a huge, um, like, family in Vegas that, like, arranged every single event in Vegas at the time around that, like, around that time. And it was, it was such a huge event. Like, you know, so many pros came down. It was, like, crazy. So that was, like, one of my um, – oh, wait, no, I totally forgot. Okay. So my first, like, real, real event um, was, like – immediately after moving to Wisconsin, it was my first MKO, MKO 2015. Mm -hmm. And just like walking into that room, like I just like, you just felt like a rush of like, wow, this is like nuts. Just seeing like all of these like pros that you've seen for like the longest time. And like, you don't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. All I wanted to do was just like get pictures with them and just like vibe <laughs> out with them. So like, I literally have a post on Instagram where I'm just like, posting i don't know how to take selfies back then so i literally would be like face down 
It'd be like, <laughs> at, it'd be at this angle. I was like, you know, oh, it's like, let's take a picture. And if he's down at that angle, I'm like, what? Like, what are you thinking? Yeah, the the angles of selfies slowly went yeah. from like beneath us looking up yeah. at the sky to like now it's looking down I'll at us see, so we yeah. can see our toes. We'll we'll finally find a happy medium in the middle one day. Exactly. The recorrect, it's coming. <laughs> so like that event was so impactful to me because that was my first interaction with like soul. Like that's when I bought my first soul dama. It was a um a walnut oak a uh, half split flow and mm. like that's when i um that's when i met chad that's when i met shelton it was like it was crazy and funny enough like um I, I was just like vibing i was just trying to like you know just do tricks just uh just like vibe and try and vibe with other kids because i was like really introverted back then and you know i was just, like I, I did like I tucked the triple lighthouse flip because I'd never done one before <laughs> and I stuck it and the moment like you know I was like doing it to when I stuck it like former pro of Soul Kanamas Cal Nasser just comes yep. walking by I stick the spike and he's like let's go and I'm like oh my god I can't believe I just did that dude that it feels was, so good when that happens when yeah. when like you hit something and a pro walks by and they're like yo okay exactly and just like that interaction just like like I, I remember that interaction so vividly and that was just like one of like the highlights back then and that that kind of like skyrocketed my belief that like wow this is this is really what i want to do mm -hmm. yeah wow and yeah that's a defining moment for sure when you finally get that affirmation and whatever you're doing i think that's a moment that changes it for a lot of people no matter what you're doing whether or not it's like music or kendama or your work it's like the moment that you get that word of affirmation from someone that you look up to that says like, Hey, good job, man. You, you rock that. You're like, wait, it really? feels so good. It feels so good. It feels so good. And I, I mean, like as, as leaders in the economic community, we, we, we try to, and we, we could al always be better at recognizing mm -hmm. people and, you know, shouting them out and being like, yo, Holmes, great job. You're killing it. Cause that's the stuff that keeps people invested and motivated. The more that we try to separate ourselves from other people, it's like, ah, that doesn't end up serving anyone. <laughs> that doesn't help the community Dude. at all. You, you're speaking straight facts right now because like I like whenever I can I always try to do like you know like what you said just you know try to hype up some like random person because you never know like what someone's going through at the time and you never know if that like one comment will like make their entire week oh totally I you know I uh Madi from Sulab he, he i don't know if he has a robot or what but he likes every single post i've ever seen on instagram but i know for so many people if you're like a fresh kanama player uh, you post a clip it's probably going to get liked by Madi if you use the hashtag yeah. kanama but even to just see that like for anyone even if it's fake or if it's a robot i don't know mm -hmm. but but if to just see that like come through from someone who is like exceptional at kanama who's very very good it means so much to someone that is just starting out. It's like you're, you're getting affirmation from someone. And it's like, I, I don't know. We, we, we have to steward that as leaders in the economic community to, to, to equip the next generation of players and inspire them. Cause that you wouldn't be where you are today if not for the recognition of, of a lot yeah. of the pros before you. So absolutely. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. 100%. Oh, that that's super cool. So it was at MKO where this happened, but then you were talking about the Las Vegas Kanama open. Yeah. So catch me up in the gap space between those two events and kind of what was going on in your world at that point. Yeah. So, um, so like when I moved to Wisconsin, I was like the only player back then, like nobody had ever heard of Kanama. Nobody had ever seen Kanama. So I like brought Kanama to school one day and that set off like a whole chain reaction over there. I got like a whole bunch of people playing over there and I was just like, wow, I can't believe I did this. And like, unfortunately, it got you know banned the next year. But you know, I'm I'm <laughs> the I'm classic just, like, the yeah, classic banning no, of Kendama exactly. in school. <laughs> but I'm just I'm just glad to have like you know made the impact that like I was able to. But and you were only in Wisconsin for a couple of years, right? You said yeah for 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 like three ish years or so. Okay, and do people? So is there anyone still playing in Wisconsin that you know that we would know still in the community? Um, in my town, I don't think so. But in like uh, the next town over, um, there's like this dude who is actually friends with my dad's friend's kid. So it, 
just it, it's a really weird like you know kind of like uh like relationship but like you know i have yet to meet him i hopefully mm-hmm. i can like meet him the next time i go up there but yeah so he lives in duluth and duluth is like a few miles away from the town that i lived in wisconsin which is superior mm-hmm. so he's the he's the like one of the only people that i know like around that area that like play but other than that a lot of my friends like you know they kind of like matured out of it but like they they still have it like on their shelves and stuff Mm -hmm. but they they just don't play anymore which is fine yeah well what was that like for you i mean you've you've brought it up a couple times that you're pretty introverted uh leading that charge at that school that you were at where you kind of fostered something was that was that hard for you did you find that challenging or difficult or uncomfortable being someone who's introverted then leading the growth of something at your school Mm -hmm. Was that weird? Yeah, no, that was yeah, one hundred one hundred percent weird. I'm I'm still like a bit like you know like bit like uh, anxious and like awkward at times. Like I'm a bit better now, but back then I was just like, w- how do I like lead this? Because uh, I like I like playing more of a support role than like a leadership mm-hmm. role. But back then I'd obvi- I obviously had to you know step up and kind of just stimulate the growth of the community like or what little community that i had back then so i was just like well you know i just gotta suck it up and you know just i never know what can happen so and yeah yeah that's cool i i think a lot of people assume that you have to have some extroverted leadership capabilities or whatever to run something or do something or make something happen i don't think that's true and obviously you've proved that I I think if you just have a passion for something that you really love and you want to share that passion with one or two people, you're going to start to see that grow into other, other people's lives. You know, you can create that compounding effect by just engaging one person and having them engage other people with that same passion that you've instilled in them. And it sounds like that's kind of what happened for you is you just brought the doms and you're like, Hey, this is something I really love. Give it a go. Yeah. Literally like a chain reaction. It was like, it was insane. Yeah. So for those of you listening, no matter who you are, your personality, you can spread Kendama. You can do it. <laughs> yes, please. Please do that. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Okay, so then you came back to Vegas. What was that like? Mm-hmm. So you left Vegas. So th- this is going to be crazy to me because you picked up Kendama in Vegas, you mm-hmm. left, and now you moved back to Vegas. Yeah. What was that like? Because obviously there was a change in Vegas that would have happened from when you were there to when you came back in that three-year gap in between. Yeah, yeah 100%. So I... I came back to Vegas um, when I was, you know, already added on to um, the street team at the time. I was like, okay, I was on the team for, I'd say, yeah, about like a year or so. I, I, I've been on the team ever since uh, April, early April 2017. And I moved back to Vegas around um, summer of 2018. So just like I came back hoping to see that, you know, the community was still thriving and mostly everyone had kind of gone MIA, just like, you know, like you know, a little like. It, it fizzled like, out. Like it. Yeah, it, yeah, it fizzled it, out. It quieted down, that's for sure. Wait, Obviously, there's a few that stuck around, but yeah. But yeah, sorry, go ahead. So um, when, I, when I came back to Vegas, uh, that was when, like, you know, Kevin kind of stepped up and we, we that's when we, like, you know, kind of started hanging out a, a decent amount and we started, like, vibing and just doing whatever we can. We, like, whenever uh, we had the chance, we just, like, brought a few of our, like, homies that, like, haven't played in a little bit and we just, like, brought them out and we just have, like, sessions on his driveway just, you know, mm-hmm. just vibing, just, like, playing can, playing follow, just talking and like those experiences are kind of like what make me love Vegas because like it's like such a small thing but just being around the people that kind of like help me like grow and uh, enrich how I am like as Mm -hmm. a person in the economic community that's like you know like I I can't thank them enough for that did you find that easier to to step into than what it was before? Because before that, it was lots of big events, big gatherings, and all all the hype of Las Vegas Kanama. Mm-hmm. Whereas now, when you returned, it was more like a, a small group of friends that were still playing and just session yeah. and enjoying it. Did you find that a better place for you to fit in? Um. So I had the privilege. I had to like you know the sponsor player privilege. Privilege. Right. Like I don't know how it'd be if I you know didn't have like 
the thankful sponsorship that Soul gave me. Yeah. But yeah, so like right off the bat, just having like being able um being able to get sponsored by Chad and stuff like that and like having a teammate literally, you know, half an hour away that kinda that kinda like really was able to help me um I was kind of like uh, I was kind of young gun out there. Like I I wasn't really known at all. And like even even when I moved back, the only people that really know really knew me were Kevin. So Kevin really helped me like uh, able to some like spread my name around mm -hmm. in in Vegas and stuff like that. So yeah, that that really helped a lot. Yeah. No. Totally. So you. What would, okay, so you talk about the sponsored privilege piece. Do you think that if you didn't receive that sponsorship, that would have changed what it was like coming back to Vegas? Do you think you'd still be playing, or was that a key moment for you to get that sponsorship? That was, that was definitely a key moment for me because you don't know how many times that I've had, like, I, I'm sure, like, every Canon player has had it, but um, there'd be a lot of times where I'd just be, like, playing by myself and, like, man like what's what's really like driving me like this it's so hard to play nowadays by myself and it really just sucks but like the literally the moment i like got on the team like it sparked such a huge motivational boost in me i'm like wow this is like this is crazy like you know i mm -hmm. this is something i really want to do for like the next like however many years or so yeah, what, was that the goal for you to get sponsored? Was that something you were really chasing for? And if so, why? Like, what did you want out of sponsorship? Um, back then, like, I really, I was just playing, you know, to play. It wasn't until, mm -hmm. like, I met Chad in, um, at LBKO 2016. That's when I, like, realized, I was like, wow, I, I really want to go for this company. And, like, it, it was two people that made me, like, want to go for Seoul. It was Chad and former pro will shyby just like yeah. you know because because just like talking to them both at like what is it like one of the like first couple like pro events that i've been to and just like having them be so like open open like you know loving to me to just like some random kid out of nowhere that was mm -hmm. just like that that really helped out a lot yeah, that makes total sense. So obviously, Seoul stood out for you in, in terms of that. Had you looked at trying to go for any other companies? Or was it just Seoul <laughs> all the way? Or did you well, did you <laughs> enter any of those like sponsorship videos or anything like that? I haven't done a deep, deep dive oh, on your YouTube edits. But did you enter yeah. into any of them? So on my old YouTube, uh, I have a sponsorship entry for a company. I'm sure you're somewhat familiar with it. Uh, RWB Kendamas, yeah, because they were they they were looking for two pros back then, and I entered um, only playing sweets Kendamas. So, <laughs> yeah, so I I like you know it's safe to assume I didn't really get in, which sucks, but yeah, so. totally. Then so did after RWB, you were like, no, 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 I'm just going for yeah. Seoul. I met Chad, I met Will, mm -hmm. I met Cal Nasser as well. You know, you yeah. you met all these cool people that man, Will and Cal need to come back to to play in Kendama and get back in the scene. That's and what I'm saying, dude. Oh we're gonna, we're gonna the melting of Will and and, uh, <laughs> and Cal for sure. We're gonna have to make that happen. But uh, okay, so you ended up getting on the the Seoul team. You moved back to Vegas, and Vegas started to go through this new resurgence where it started to pick up again, or probably yeah. around that time that you returned. Do you think that you played a role in that, where where Vegas started to gain some momentum again? Because now Vegas is a hotbed again for Kanama. Mm -hmm. Like in the same way that a lot of Californians are moving to Vegas, a lot of great yeah. Kanama players are moving to Vegas. <laughs> yeah, uh, I like to. Like, not as huge of a role as Kevin played, but I'd like to think that, you know, I played, like, somewhat of a role because, like, every clip that I posted from, like, 2018 to, like, you know, now, mm -hmm. like, I try to promote Vegas as much as I can because, like, my love for Vegas like, is immeasurable, you know, so. Yeah, what, to... what do you love about Vegas? Like, what what is it about Vegas that you love? Um, Mostly... Like the majority of it is mostly the people, obviously Kevin and like the people that I've met through like hanging out with him and stuff like that. But other than that, like the culture here is just like it's it's fantastic. Um, just like being able to experience like so many like different cultures here. It, yeah, it's like it's pretty nice. But like it, what's weird is that like you know a lot a lot of my friends say that they don't like Vegas and like they like you know oh like I want to move out of here as soon as possible. Like, I mm -hmm. want to move to California. And I'm just like, 
I mean, it's it's not that bad. Like it's you know it's a it's a pretty nice place to live. It's pretty chill. You know it. You know nothing really like bad ever go. Okay, knock on wood, but like nothing really ever like you know mm-hmm. seriously goes bad here. But yeah, that's that's one of like the few reasons why I, like, I really like Vegas and like why like I continue to stick around here. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Okay, so uh, give me give me some insight on your style of play. You are a very technically advanced Canelo mm-hmm. player. You really like tech. You've created a trick that has you know taken twenty twenty yeah. by storm, the long tap, uh, and you know there's a number of elements to your play style that I really admire. You're very controlled, very calculated, and you know I maybe see that overlapping a little bit with your growth in violin, where it's all about mm-hmm. practice and precision. Violin is, you know, I I've I've tried violin once. I was not very mm-hmm. good at it. Uh, but but from my understanding, like violin, you don't have frets or anything. There's no like, yeah, you just have to learn. And it's by muscle memory and hearing and all these things. Did you see an overlap in your growth with Kanama and violin in, in a parallel there for you? Um, Like now that, now that you say that, like, you know, I, I definitely see uh, kind of an overlap. Because you said like um, you had a hard time with violin and like just like being able to like play violin. There's so many like hard like little tiny intricacies and that's what like you know i like to incorporate in my play as much as possible just like mm-hmm. little like things here and there that kind of make you take a double take like what did, what did he do again like that was yeah kind of, that was kind of crazy yeah so like what, i guess the the root question i want to know is like what inspires your kanama play because it's a very unique style of play mm-hmm. uh, did you draw inspiration from anywhere or did you just happen to kind of stumble into the style that you're in um I so okay. My play style back then was incredibly combo based. I only did like combos and flow, and like it was just it was at the point where, um, like I was like doing these hard combos and I wasn't really getting anywhere. I was like, mm-hmm. dang, this is this is so like tough. Like I don't know if I can like continue doing this. So that's kind of why like I branched off into uh like single like tech tricks because like even though it's like you know it's a quick burst you're able to get off a lot of reps so that you have Mm -hmm. more possible chances of getting that trick right so instead of doing long like three minute or like (laughs) i call them the white tricks why literally (laughs) has like one trick yeah that's a full minute long clip but but you you've changed that script a little bit you are focusing on these highly technically advanced tricks Mm -hmm. that may only be three seconds long but you have to slow it down to see all the little intricacies of what you're doing and and that's that's kind of been the style that you've been been rocking with at least for a little bit generally speaking so yeah what how has that affected your play and you know talk to talk to me a little bit through your mentality of how you approach your tricks now um yeah so so kind of how like how i approach my tricks now like i stem a lot of inspiration from like all my other like you know pro players and Mm -hmm. even like you know like players that like haven't really gotten their name out yet and like i consume like so much media like if i'm not if i'm not playing i'm like i'm like watching edits like i'm re-watching edits that i've watched like you know back then just trying to get like new ideas mm-hmm. and it's like sometimes it'd be from that sometimes it'd be like even on accident and um and so this is like how my thinking kind of goes like if i did like a concept here's like where I branch off. Like mm-hmm. what if I did, what if I did this to fast hand? What if I did this triple? What if I did this to penguin? What if I did this like inward? So like, it's like I, I kind of do like, I have a concept in mind and I try to branch out to see like, you know, what all the possible possibilities are. And I just, you know, kind of like center in on one. And that's how like I decide on like a trick to post or like a trick to like put in an edit. Mm-hmm yeah so do you plan your tricks because you know i i could never come up with the concept of doing a long tap Mm -hmm. like i don't know how i would ever come up with that in my head until i like accidentally hit it and it like flipped around i was like wait a minute this Mm -hmm. is possible but do you do you think about it before you do it and you're like what if i just hit it this way like are you mathematically inclined to look at the ken and the tama and be like if i just do this it will do this and rotate in that way or or does it start out as kind of like oh let's just find out what happens if i hit it like that yeah uh it's funny you say that because like you know i so like 
um, Lynn Whalen in 2016, in his grip entry in 2016, he accidentally did like a triple flip to Wong Tap. And mm. it was like crazy. And like he looked shocked because like, you know, it was like totally on accident. And I was, um, I was like randomly doing it one day because like what's strange enough is like I have a terrible memory. I have a terrible short term memory. I'm not afraid to admit that. But when it comes to when it <laughs> don't comes forget to, that he said that in a couple yeah. seconds. <laughs> it's like what did I say? <laughs> but um, when uh, when it comes to uh, tricks in edits, I have like a strange like quirky memory of like you know oh this trick was done in this edit in this year and like you know that's crazy. So I was like trying it randomly one one day because like, I remember that trick from that edit. And I was like oh my god this is possible because like you know i was like doing it like trying to make sure that like trying to see if it like was a fluke was it like was it not a fluke and i landed it like a few times like oh my god this is possible so like you know that's kind of that's how i kind of like went into the thought process for wong tap but like most of the time it's like a lot of trial and error a lot of seeing like mm. huh, is, is this possible like i kind of have like a, a huge list of like you know hard maybes of like tricks to do in my phone and like every once in a while like i i try it out and see if like you know anything's changed because like a trick back then that like i wasn't able to hit i was like you know okay i'm gonna like put that off to the side and remember it like a few months later see if i can mm -hmm. if, if i was able to do it and like you know a few months later i come back to it and I'm like okay this is this is a little bit more possible so a, a yeah. lot of it is yeah yeah, sometimes you got to park a trick for a little bit and mm -hmm. you there's okay, uh do you do you watch TED Talks ever? Uh yeah, sometimes. Okay, so there's one TED Talk, one of my favorite TED Talks of all time uh by an organizational psychologist Adam Grant. Uh I love Adam Grant. He is great. I anyways, I could I could rave about him for a while. But in his one TED Talk, he talks about procrastination and precrastination. And I think it plays such a huge role in my Kenoma play and I think it's actually a, a skill set that a lot of people in Konoma can pick up where you can initiate the learning of something months prior, even though you're not, a, you know, at that place. So, you know, you could see a trick, like say something that Ben Harold's doing or an yeah. idea that doesn't even exist yet, like something totally out there. And as long as you've initiated that idea and written it down and maybe attempted it one or two or three times and given it some go, then don't touch it again for a while, come yeah. back later. And all of a sudden you've, had that sitting in the back of your head and your subconscious for so long that your brain's been processing all the little intricacies of what goes into it, regardless of whether or not you've been attempting it, that the moment you come back to it, it's way more easy to approach that it comes to you and you're like, Oh wait, no, this makes sense. Now I can do this and it's clicking and it's, it's ridiculous how much that works because you come back to a trick that you haven't touched in four months, but all the other growth that you've experienced now just allows you to like hit that. And it's like, cra it's crazy. Yeah. It works. Exactly, yeah, Same 100%. thing with homework. If you start your homework early, but then like leave it for a little bit and then come back to it, that's one of the best ways to do homework. No, no cap. That, like seriously studied. That that is like an organizational psychologist approach to doing homework is pre you. He calls it original thinking, but uh, pre procrastinating and procrastinating. Yeah, someone put yeah. that TED talk in the comments. It's uh, Adam Grant uh, originals. I think is or the surprising habit of original thinkers i think is what the, the full title is my favorite ted talk of all time yeah i can't um i can't say the same for my homework ethic but <laughs> my, my my kanama ethic is really like you know much higher than my homework ethic but what's funny enough is that um i like not a lot of people know this but like i'm a completionist like mm. if if something like is you know kind of like on my mind it's gonna stay on my mind and like, if like until like I forget about it or if I get it done like whether that be like you know a trick or like just some kind of some kind of issue that's been going on throughout the week so mm -hmm. that's kind of why like I come back to the tricks because it's just like you know man like this is really like you know bugging me like I I shouldn't have to um wait this long for like a trick to like it's for it for, for me to be able to land it so it's just like you know it's it's kind of like if you imagine like a rubber bat repeatedly hitting you, that's kind of how like, you know, tricks are sometimes like if I don't land a trick, like in, it'll eat a, you in a, yeah, it'll eat me up inside. And like, I'm going to want to film like the next day, like no matter like I'm dude, I'm sore, but like, dude, like let me add that trick again. I swear I'm going to land it. Like I need to land this, like, you know, just oh, yeah. for myself.
And and I think people see that in you too, because I remember watching your Mari edit uh, for the oh, Evangelion yeah. mod. And what, I can't remember what the one trick was, but it was at the end and you just like let out this like visceral, like, yeah. I, it was, I don't know what it was, but it was some, something deep down inside that came out of you when you hit that. And it looked like you had been, you just been at that, that that thing had been consuming you for so long that when yeah. you finally hit it, it was like the biggest sense of relief that you've experienced. Is that, is that right? Yeah, one hundred percent. The yeah, the trick you're talking about was a uh, five tap long tap, and just yep. like I, I conceptualized the trick, and I was just like, dude, I, I don't think I can land this right now. Like, I that's gonna be like a, a two three year down the road trick, and like I put like a solid like hour two hours into it, just like barely like you know drinking any water. I was just like heavy breathing, like out of my mind, and like you know I. I, I got it and I was like, oh my God. And that's like how the majority of the tricks mm -hmm. in that edit were. Cause like, um, like a lot of the, like, there were only six tricks in that edit, but all of them were just like so incredibly hard to me. And like, I was going through a lot at that time. So like being able to land those tricks, um, like within like, it took a few hours, all of them, all of them took like minimum, like two hours. So being able to like land them after like such a long film session mm -hmm. combined with the fact that like, you know, you have like stuff going on in your life. It like, that's what kind of yeah. led to those pop-offs. Yeah. That was crazy edit. And obviously it was really well done. Shout out to Brett Walters. Cause he was the guy. Who shout out Brett. That, right? yeah, Brett, yeah. Brett, I always like to give a shout out to the people that film because you might hear that side of the story where it's like Kelvin grinding for this, grinding for it. The oh cameraman's also sitting there grinding with you. <laughs> I there, There's so many like instances where like, I felt so bad cause I was like taking so long. So I have to like continually like apologize. Like Brett, I'm so sorry, dude. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I suck right now. I'm like, you know, it, it won't happen it, and i landed like an hour later no i swear it's gonna be a quick trick like this is totally one i can hit in like 10 minutes T just trust me three yeah. hours later <laughs> yeah dude and like you know after our film sessions like you know he'd be like oh like my back and like you know and like there, there's this one film session where like he was like you know like knees thighs and shins like on the grass and like i saw his legs after i'm like holy hell I'm so sorry. I take so long for tricks sometimes. And yeah, I, I got to give him props because he, he grinded just as hard as me. Yeah, no. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. The, the filmers in the community, man, they put on for the game yeah. and people, people don't always see it. And so always taking the moment to shout out the guys behind the lens is, is always appreciated. But okay, so I heard a lot uh, about your story and a little bit of where you got to in getting on the soul team, but then you got to design your own Kendama the first time ever on a vibe lineup. So you were showing us at the beginning. That was obviously a huge moment, or at least I assume it was a huge moment. Uh, I think anyone who's played Kendama dreams of that sponsorship, getting their own Kendama design, all that kind of stuff. But what, what was that like for you? Yeah, dude, that, like it was literally insane. Like, and I, I have a weird memory of like remembering when like stuff happens, like really, like really impactful stuff happens in like my Kanama career. So uh, I remember I was on my way to like a birthday party of like, of like some family friend. Right. And like my dad was driving me mm -hmm. and I randomly got a text from Chad. It's like uh, something along the lines of like, you know, Hey, start thinking of designs for your flow, uh, for your vibe. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, he was like, you know, like, you're on the flow team, buddy. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, I I was, like, waiting for that day for, like, so long. I was just like, oh, my God, this is insane. Like, I literally get to, like, design a Kanama. It's, like, it it's so, like, surreal. And, like, the, the design process is, like, kind of surreal, too, because, like, I thought I knew what I had in mind. But, you know, when they came, I was just like, wow, yeah, this is this is harder than I thought. Cause like I have like so many like options and so many possibilities, mm -hmm. but you know, I just like couldn't really center around one. So like, I have to thank like Chad for like being able to like, mm -hmm. like being so patient throughout the like design process and just like kind of like spitballing ideas to me and like one eventually stuck. And that's how I ended up with the, uh, with this first one. Yeah. Uh, talk, talk me through some of the design on that. What, what was the inspiration yeah. behind that colorway and that design? Yeah. So this uh, this vibe is called uh, the Ray after um, like one of like the main girls in uh, 
Neon Genesis Evangelion. So this is like the color of her uh, suit, right? Um, so like the lavender, the blue, and the red. And I I wanted the the seventy thirty because like you know that was kind of like a bit popular at, at the time. And yeah, so that was the main inspiration. And funny enough, I got this uh, wood burn by uh, Keegan Keegan Sablon, and uh, it was yeah I I that's why i still have this to this day because like this is was like, that your first one that you ever this is, you this ever is the got? first one this is the first one that like you know i took out of the bag and like i held it in my hands i'm like holy crap i i literally designed a kanama i'm like dude what the heck is going on that's and, awesome. like I, I literally have a picture that i sent to kevin i'm just like and like just looking so happy and so giddy and he's like ha, ha. <laughs> that's awesome and he would have gotten his probably around that same time and, and yeah. he had such a unique design too i i think that's one of the coolest things about the soul team like even though it's technically not a pro mod it kind of is in some ways because you got mm -hmm. to play a role in designing it uh, yeah, and exactly. and that, I, I don't know i think that that's such a beautiful piece of being on the soul team as a flow member is that everybody kind of has their own piece of soul where they get to add to it they're not just repping the brand they're a part of it they play a role yeah. in the design process so i think it, i i think it's great i think it's so cool and obviously a great doma a uh, great tracking thank you okay, but thank you. but okay here, here's where we got to get nerdy i, I want to dive into anime mm. here a little bit and and learn tell me what neon uh, genesis evangelion is i looked a little bit online but i wanted to hear it from you i wanted to get the kelvin wong pitch on neon neon genesis evangelion is that right did i say it right? yeah Just. yeah it's a uh... Dude, it's a crazy anime. So like that was um, it's it's got to be top five for me. Like I was watching it um, like while I was still living in Wisconsin, and I went into it like thinking like, oh, this is just gonna be like some normal like robot anime. Yeah, no, it like it just turns into like something like somewhat like abstract, but like so like beautiful. It's it's actually like insane. So it's um, it starts out as uh like uh, a mecha anime like uh the main character shinji right his dad wants him to pilot this robot called the ava and like you know and there's these monsters that come from uh these like biblical like you know monster ish mm -hmm. things called angels that kind of like come down to uh this futuristic tokyo that they live in and you know they use the ava to like defeat the monsters right. and that's how it was like for like the first half of the anime but then like you know you as the lore goes on like literally i don't it, it's been a while since like i like i rewatched it but the ava and the angels are actually like related like is that okay oh shoot that's kind of like okay are you are you Forget. spoiling it for me <laughs> sort of, well it, it's sort of kind of but no no, like, no it's okay. okay how how long is this show like how many seasons it's um it's 26 episodes and then there is um there's a movie and then there's the rebuild movies after that oh so it's not that long it's only 26 episodes yeah but it it like while you're watching it it's so long it's like it's crazy so like um so is, it, is this like pacific rim but like anime is this is this what this is sort of kind of but okay. more like more like psych psycho psychological and like you know just really like ethereal like really like spacey and like, yeah, like yeah. the concepts are just like wow okay super cool yeah. i'll have to go watch it then and then I'll, I'll give my official review eventually i've been i've been trying to dive a little bit into to the anime culture in this past year i've, I've I, I mean i've talked a little bit about it on other episodes but trying to dive through a few shows i i just watched a new show it's not technically an anime i don't think but uh, the dragon prince on netflix have you, have you heard of it i have not heard by, of that one co-created by one of the co-creators of avatar the last airbender Oh, really? Storytelling, fantastic, but the animation in the first season is a little weird because it's 2D on 3D, and oh, they do it okay. at a low FPS, so it's very, like, it looks kind of like you're, like, watching stop motion a little bit in the first okay. season, but then they speed up the FPS in the second season, and, it, and it's got really good pacing, really good show. Okay, I'll, I'll give that one a try, yeah. It's, um, it's more a cartoon than it is an anime. It's not, okay. I think it is technically, quote-unquote, a cartoon. Okay, for sure. Um, so I, I just saw a comment that, uh, what is it, MJ just put in the chat. So um, a huge thing that, like, uh, to remember, like, when you're watching the anime is, like, like 
episodes 25 and 26 are kind of like you know iffy like you know they're, they're still like crazy episodes but like they're they're just like you know kind of like recaps and just really like delve into like the psychological yeah like aspect of the anime but like what really seals the deal and like brett can like you know agree with me on this is the movie that comes after mm. the end of evangelion like so they they end it with a movie yeah so you, you so like you watch the whole entire anime and then you follow up with the end of evangelion and that just like you know the, they bump up the psychological aspect like times 10 it's it's insane it's a crazy like you're you have to prepare like you know your emotions for it because it's like mm -hmm. you you leave like watching the movie like like what just happened like you're like numb you're just like what the are hell? they gonna make more is is there more um, to it or is it done no so um so after the end of evangelion there's like the rebuild movies and the last rebuild movie uh, the fourth one, it, like, came out in Japan. I wish I could watch it, but, you know, I have to wait a little bit. But that fourth one is the last one from the okay. for the franchise. So I don't think there's any more content coming from that. Okay, interesting. So, but that, that you haven't seen the last one yet. And that, yeah. And then it's done. Are you ready yeah. for that? Are you ready to be done? No. It, <laughs> it, it, what's funny is that, like, it's it's taken, like, 10 years for, like, it to come out. So it's just, like, this long build. But yeah, Crazy. what Brett what Brett said is uh, make sure you watch the anime first and then follow up okay. with the movie because the anime yeah. is still definitely worth watching. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so here's the real question though: You've designed both of your kendamas, the Mari and uh, mm -hmm. the Ray, after Evangelion. Why? Why yeah. has this played such an important role in your life, and why choose to to pick colorways or inspiration from that anime than from anything else in your life, like violin or your family or Vegas mm -hmm. or whatever it is? Like, why why the anime in particular? Uh, I think like like both around both those times are when like you know, um I like anime I was like consuming a lot of anime I haven't really like consumed much of it recently I've like been reading a lot of manga but um yeah like just I've been watch I was watching like a lot of anime at the time like you know throughout like so many like different genre mm. like genres like and I was just like I was just really struggling to find uh a, like a concept a colorway for like what i wanted to do for my vibe and like i ha i obviously have to plug um adrian it be adrian for this he's the homie he mm -hmm. like kind of like uh he had a like an idea for um like if he were to get like a dom or so like he'd inspire off of like a colorway off of a sailor moon and that got me thinking so i have to thank him for like introducing me to mm. the the anime like color inspo thing. right so yeah totally man there's so many places to draw inspiration from uh, you know i i mm. obviously like even though I, I don't ever intend on going pro or like not not that i even think that's a reality but if i were to design a kanama like where, where would i draw inspiration from and i think everyone who plays kanama and who's been playing for uh, playing for a little while starts thinking it's like, yeah. ooh, if I ever get a pro mod, what am I going to design it? What are going to be the things? Am I going to put a picture of my dog on it? Or I don't know. But I think it's cool that you drew inspiration from something that isn't actually something you created. Yeah. It's something that you pulled out of something you love and you brought it into a different world that is somewhat connected. You know, it's yeah. obviously two Japanese subcultures that are now bridged together by what you've done in both your mods. In the Mari. So uh, give me a, a brief snapshot on the Mari and how you designed that. And then we'll, we'll take a little break. We'll answer some questions from the chat. Okay. And then we'll, sure. we'll dive into a little bit more of the like analytical side of your com competing style. I want to really get into because you're, okay. you're an excellent competitor when it comes to Kanama and you're very you. practiced in how you do it. And I want to dive into your methodology a little bit, but yeah, uh, sure. yeah talk to me about the Mari. Um, so like, um, so with the Mari, like I kind of wanted to, continue the theme of like anime like colorways because i thought it'd be like only right because you know to have like one anime colorway and then another colorway kind of like you know a whole different thing I would, like in my mind that'd be like a little weird so i kind of want to continue the theme and i was like really struggling to like find like a colorway for that one too i was like i had um I had like a few like rough drafts. Like I put like the color palettes of some like the anime that I was watching of like some like the main characters. And I was like, okay, that'd be interesting. That'd be interesting too. And like, I, I, I don't know. Like I just like always kind of circled back to Evangelion because like just the colors 
in that show were like so nice and i remember one character i was like huh who's that who's that girl in the rebuild movies right so like i looked it up and i was like that that is a sick colorway i want that so mari isn't actually like in the um, uh in the like the main like anime and the end of evangelion she comes in in the rebuild movies and like uh she's kind of like you know this like spunky like teen like totally mm-hmm. uncharacteristic from the other characters and just like you know i i don't know just something about like her colorway stuck out to me and i was like okay yeah nobody has done this yet and like i really like i really like the pink because like you know you don't really see mm-hmm. a lot of pink in the konami no, community not too much yeah so i you know gave the idea to chad and chad like you know drew up uh a bunch of variations of like the lines of mari and like i came to one and i was like yep that's the one and so that's how i came up with it that's awesome that's super cool mm-hmm. do you so in, in the event that you guys do another lineup of vibes or mm-hmm. in an earlier or later event uh, when you get your pro mod or if you go pro you know yeah. do you have an inspiration in mind of what you'd want to design or do you want to keep that a secret oh dude that's like one of like the main things that's been on my mind like for like the past like year or so uh i can i can delve into it like a little bit but okay I'm gonna, yeah I'm te- gonna... tease us a little bit yeah but hold, hold back hold back a yeah little bit. <laughs> for sure so um i think i'd say like the two main things about it are 100 percent vegas and classical music 100%. okay so you're and gonna also... break, break from the the evangelion mold yeah but like um i have such a sick idea for like the emblem and the emblem kind of ties into my family's history in okay kind of like food and the restaurant business because a lot of my family came from china and uh like they you know needed a, to find a way to like make a living and one of the only things that they knew was like you know cooking so yeah. so many family members of mine have like restaurants and stuff like that and they've made like you know a pretty like a pretty like a lot of them have made a pretty like big name for themselves so yeah do, that's, does uh, your your parents or do you come from a restaurant business as well like your family uh yeah like both my mom's side and my dad's side like i like you know grew up around um just like being around restaurants and stuff like that dude that's sick that's so cool yeah. do, so do your parents own a restaurant then or do you uh no they don't own a restaurant um but like just like family members of like yeah. aunts uncles stuff like that that's awesome that's so cool uh do you have a favorite well we'll jump into some questions here last question yeah. and then we'll jump in yeah. i keep there's so many things i want to ask but yeah uh what what is like a classic dish that is like your favorite in the family business or the restaurant business of, of you know like what what you're familiar with if you were to cook okay i'll rephrase if i were to come over to your house kelvin what would you cook me uh It'd be, it'd be like one of three things. So it'd be either uh green pepper steak, which is like, you know, one of like my most favorite dishes that okay. like my aunt cooks, uh, mapo tofu, mapo, to- oh my God, mapo, mapo tofu is so <laughs> good. It's, um, it's, it's a spicy tofu stew with ground pork and like, you know, some like pickled vegetables in there. It's so good. And, uh, Kung Pao chicken, Kung Pao mm-hmm. chicken is like fantastic okay so, okay and not nothing like the not, nothing like a chinese buffet like real authentic Ch- chinese food i'm 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 stoked yeah. for it, man i'm 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 already yeah. checking my flights right after this <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome okay uh let's hit up a couple questions from the chat from the patreon and okay. and let's dive through some of these and then we'll we'll jump into kind of more of the modern conversation of what's going on today okay. Will do. Okay, a patreon subscriber Brett Walters Boston mm-hmm. W on Instagram wants to know actually it's more like a it's more like a statement or an accusation yeah. is, is what this really reads as. He says, will you please admit on Brewview that your competing style is really a huge intimidation flex and not just a casual way to focus? Thanks. Uh, now, to, before, before you answer that, to preface for those of you that haven't seen Kelvin compete, you have a very calculated way of approaching every trick. Every trick has a buildup to it before you attempt it. I remember watching this at NAKO 2019 when you were competing in Final 16 on stage and like every every time you'd line up and maybe you, you actually could probably tell me better. You have yeah. the exact same pattern of what you do before every trick. Can you tell us what it is? Or even better, you could tell us and show us. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, t- I'll tell you first. So um, 
so I kind of just like, you know, I see the trick. I'm just like, okay. So I take a deep breath and like, I take like the deepest breath possible. I hold it in. And like, while, while I'm kind of like doing that, like I'm thinking of like someplace serene, someplace to kind of like, no, give me, give heart. me a place to think about. I'm going to, I'm, I'm trying to practice like, this. Like, like, like think of like a field of flowers. I think of like, you know, just like you're on the beach and stuff like that. It's just like nothing else is going on. You're just like in the moment right there, right then and there. Nothing else is going on, just the trick. And I open my eyes slowly. I, you know, I just kind of like, you know, focus on the can. I adjust my glasses because that's kind of like a tick of mine of some sorts. And do you, I yeah, go. Do you, how do you, do you have a specific way you adjust? Are you a grab by uh, the side or are you a push straight up? I'm going to push straight up, but okay. with like, you know, kind of like not with like the tip of the finger. Not the tip. Like, you, you do yeah. like the, okay. Yeah, okay. I, I do yeah. that. I'm, I'm then, learning. I'm taking my tips yeah. right now. Okay. And then like, you know, I you, where, just, like, where's your kendama while you're doing this? Is it around your neck or are you holding it? Uh, it's, it's changed a lot. Like, okay. it's kind of like evolutionized a bit. Yeah. But so whatever the trick is, I'm just like, you know, kind of like you know chest grip okay. and i'm just like lately i've been doing like you know kind of like this i don't know why but it's kind of like help me calm down like tap it against my chest i'm like kind of like help me okay. calm my nerves a bit and then you know i get ready yeah. for the trick. Oh, yeah you got to loosen up the bead so the string is and straight. Then, yeah and then and I that's go, it yeah well i'm i think we're missing something i always remember you do, you do like an arm stretch. oh yeah no i i kind of got like if i'm really and nervous the, the neck you yeah, gotta do the I'm neck really yeah <laughs> i i do that but i'm just like it, it takes so long and just like you know the breathing is like the majority of it the breathing helps like you know the most so i'm just like i'll, I'll just stick with that okay so then to brett's question is this is this a, a huge intimidation flex and not just a casual way to focus are you doing this more for you or to psych the other person out um i didn't really think of it like look it's it's more for me but as like i've competed more and more i'm like okay i can see why like people would be intimidated by this so like you know it's like the the smallest part like intimidation but most of the time it's it's just for me that's awesome uh, i'm gonna have to try that when i compete in npo next week i think i'm gonna compete next week i'm gonna oh, do dude, the, good luck the full, good luck. The full kelvin arms <laughs> do the neck uh, and if it's a stall trick, you, do you lick bevel? Uh, yeah, I lick bevel. Okay, lick lick I bevel. I probably lick it a lot. Uh, yeah, I probably <laughs> okay. too like, much. I'm, like, I'm gonna drink a lot it. of water, get a lot yeah. of moisture in there, <laughs> get that thing lathered up, and then uh, yeah, maybe a exactly. Couple, maybe a couple of chest taps in there, and then <sighs> think of the beach. Open my eyes. Lace. That's what it's gonna be. The entirety of NPO. I'm gonna make the whole event last three times longer than it needs to be. <laughs> you just, you just see, you see sweets like. <sighs> <It's> like... <laughs> That's awesome. So right. there you go, Brett. It, it's part intimidation, but mostly for Kelvin. I think actually breathwork's a huge tool that you know canola players can actually take in and and practice and get better at uh, breathwork. For a couple of reasons, like the, the science behind breathing, if you can better practice oxygenation and breathe in more, uh, that's actually going to help your ATP production in your body, which I can't remember what ATP stands for, but basically it's like the, the currency in which your muscles feed off of. And it helps to alert your brain, helps to, you know, strengthen you. You can perform better in the gym, all that sort of stuff. That's why posture and like breath work and yoga, all these things are so helpful for, for humans and for people in general. Is bra yeah. Breathing is actually like a fundamental tool for us to be stronger. So, and focus. So breath work is key. Guys, breathe better. 100%. Okay. Uh, another Patreon subscriber, Kanama Cares. Uh, they want to know what was the milestone in your play that when you passed it, your mindset shifted from being a pedestrian slayer to that of being a competitive peer of pros. You know, did, do you have a defining moment for you? Oh my God. That's, oh wow. That's, that's a crazy, I'd like to say Wong tap, but like that'd be like the obvious answer. So I kind of want to dig it a little bit deeper. It's, I think it has to be either like, you know, putting out my first, like my first Kanama edit, mm. you know, just like showing the whole world what I have to offer and just, Oh my God, 
I didn't even tell you the the story of how like you know I got asked to be on the team. It's such a hilarious story. Yeah, you can give it to us real quick yeah. if you'd like. Yeah, I was, yeah, I'll give you real quick. So, um, I was at a basketball game, right? I was at a basketball game watching my cousin, right? Like totally like unsuspecting. Like at the time, like I was just like you know repping Seoul for uh about like eight months or so, and then I get a random DM, and it's a long one, and guess who it's from it's from will shivey it's like yo like you know we'd like to invite you onto the team and like i i screamed i literally screamed out i screamed out loud i threw my phone i was like no yeah no way and like i i kind of got like you know i caught a cause the huge huge scene but you know it's really fine <laughs> but yeah one in, in the gym was yeah. it at a game or a, it was a game that you're watching it, it was it was a game yeah it was a game yeah. And then all of a sudden, everybody was watching you. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, what, what's wrong? It's like, I literally just got asked to be on, on a team. That's so, exciting. Yeah. Dude, that's crazy. That's so cool. I love hearing the stories of when people get sponsored. That, that's so, so impactful and powerful. I love it. I love it. Dude, so either that moment or my putting out my first edit, that those have to be kind of like my, my defining moments, 100%. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Kenoma Cares also wanted to know, uh, was there a specific mentor in your life who encouraged you to believe that it was your time to make this perspective shift? You know, from when you transitioned from being, you know, just a casual slayer to being a pro. So this is kind of like the second part of the question. Did you have someone that was guiding you in that journey and walking walking alongside you? Was that Will? Yeah, I. I that's got to be Kevin, 100%. Mm -hmm. Like, I... I talked to him like, you know, on my worst of days, I talked to him like, you know, just like kind of seeking guidance. Like Kevin like, has really like helped me kind of like gain confidence in my ability and kind of like shift my perspective and mm -hmm. just like in introduce me to like some new thinking that like I would have never been kind of like exposed to unless I like, I heard it from him. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, he, he has so much fantastic insight and just being able to hear him talk. It's like, you know, it's just like, yeah, like I, you know, I 100% believe what you're saying and what you're saying is like, you know, so useful to me right now. Mm -hmm. He said a lot of things that, that has really stuck to me. And that's like, you know, he's, he's kind of the one that's like helped me kind of skyrocket like my play. Like I, I'm still kind of like, you know, it, Kevin the Dark Horse. Yeah. I'm I'm still kind of like, you know, trying to make my a name for myself, but you know, he's he's really helped a lot in that journey 100%. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Yeah, Kev Kevin's a beauty and he has done so yeah. much for the Konama community. I loved my chat with him that I had a couple weeks back. And honestly, I think more people need to <laughs> to get Kevin in their in their corner as a mentor. He's such exactly. a humble guy. Uh, he is, yeah, he he's so great. Okay, a uh, question from Chan the Man 52. What is the best kind of gummy? Candy? Yeah, yeah. like what's the best kind um, of gummy? This is my go-to. It's the it's the Haribo Star Mix. So okay. it's like it's the mix of all like the gummies that Haribo has. So it's the cola gummies, uh the gummy bears, um the the sour snakes, the cherries. It's like, you know, I love mm -hmm. I love variety and like, you know, that's like why I incorporate it into my play. So that kind of like adapts into like my real life stuff. So like that's why I like the Star Mix because, you know, it's a whole like mixing pot of like all my favorite gummies. Mm. Yeah. I I haven't had gummies in a while, man. I, I grew up with so many like teeth issues and I'm like, ah, I just like don't eat sugar that much anymore. I'm like I'll just just stick to the things that are probably better for me. I, I break that a little bit here and there. Okay. Uh, Dylan J. Johnson wants to know, uh, have you ever played a sport? If so, uh, does it now affect the way you play? Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I played soccer for a little bit that like didn't have as much of an, of an impact, but, um, from, from six years old to 12 years old, I was actually like, I was in Taekwondo. Like I'm a, I'm a second degree black belt in Taekwondo and uh just like i, I kind of like adapted a lot of like the competing style and like the mentality style um from that and i you know put it into like how i play like you know as a person and mm -hmm. a lot of it is just like you know the the resilience that i've learned from like being in taekwondo and just like being able to like tough it out like that has uh really mm -hmm. helped me out a lot but do yeah you, do amazing. you still do taekwondo 
No, not anymore. It's it's been like a fair bit, but you know, I But you you could still wrestle and tussle me and take me down for sure. I never took any uh, type of down. We'll see. We'll see. I'm, I'm, pre- I'm pretty soft. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, sorry, you were, you were going to say one more thing there, I think, at the end. I cut you yeah, off. Yeah. Um, like, even though, like, I haven't done it and, like, it's kind of like, you know, like, I have mixed feelings about it. Like, I owe a lot of, of like, my mindset and stuff like that to, uh, to Taekwondo. So, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, Augusta Dama Society underscore wants to know, uh, are there things that you are OCD with or very I mean, particular about OCD is obviously, a con- but anyways, yeah. that, that, that comes to Dama. Um, yeah, 100%. Like literally like, uh, so I was with Kevin yesterday and we were hanging out and I, I gave him like, we, we traded Ken's because, um, the, the Ken that I have just like, didn't have like a special click that I like. So, if if a Ken, I'm sorry to say this, like Chad, if you're listening to this, like yeah. if a Ken has like loose cups or just doesn't have like a nice sound, like, like this sound right here, like, like it's solid. It's like you know, you're mm-hmm. like, like, so, so that kind of sound like kind of drives me to play, and it really helps me out a lot because like mm. I, like the the oral a u r a l like the oral experience that you get from like you know like getting spikes and cups, it really helps out a lot so like if it just doesn't have like the right clack then yeah I'm just like you know like iffy on it so that's one thing i'm ocd about um i used to be like you know iffy on like lunar balance and stuff like that but not anymore like if like a dama has like you know like okay lunar balance then i'll just like use that dama for like other tricks like stalls or sure uh, yeah what about uh the way you, how do you wrap your kendama when you when you put it away? oh are you a seat belt are you around one cup no it it's so weird Show, okay, show me. Yeah, now I, I've never asked this question, but I actually think it's such an interesting way. Oh yeah, you're a you're a side cup. Is that small or big? Do you wrap on small cup or big cup? Uh, I wrap on big cup, but like I wrap on this, and if it's too short here, then I do this. You do so a loop I, underneath. M- so most of the time, it's like these two loops. Okay, interesting. Why do you do it that way? Do you have a reason for it, or is that just always been the way you do it? Because that that drives me insane. I only ever like literally every single kanama that I ever. Mm-hmm wrap up i still sometimes will do the loop underneath but it's always yeah. seat belt wrapped always um i don't know i think it just like unravels easier because you could just just oh uh, and... yeah i i, I yeah. get that but for me it's like when it's in the seat belt you can do the like whoop whoop and, oh, you can, like, yeah. and then you can go right into a trick about. from it and i love the like yeah. flow of unwrapping into a trick it just like feels right to me and so that's the way i do it and like the way that you wrap it up that way it's like mm-hmm. i don't know I, I'm, I got my thing here but it's like you just like you just get the like rotation down. It's like you can just whip it around until it yeah. wraps up. It feels so good. I don't know. I I just like I've been doing that like you know as long as I can remember. And like okay, so I don't like I I actually prefer it this way because like you know if I'm like just you know subconsciously wrapping it up, I'm like oh this is too short. And like, <laughs> like if if I do like this way, I'm like I'm like oh it's too short too. So I just gotta like you know. Find yeah, perfect balance. So it's just like you know, absolutely, and that's right. So yeah, that's awesome. Okay, uh, Jarrett Black, uh, Alberta friend, homie, big anime fan, big anime lover. He wants to know what's your favorite anime soundtrack slash OST. I don't know what OST means, but uh, and why is it Cowboy Bebop? Uh, <laughs> that's not a question. That's uh, an accusation. <laughs> that is mean, such a hard position. So Cowboy Bebop, like. So OST means original soundtrack. Okay. And so um, Cowboy Bebop is like top five, but like my 100%, my most favorite anime soundtrack has got to be the soundtrack of uh, Samurai Shampoo because um, the the DJ producer that like worked on Samurai Shampoo, his uh, his name is uh, New Jabez. And he, he, revel- he kind of was like, you know, one of the first purveyors of lo-fi music. Oh, so I so, love lo-fi music. Dude, yeah, that's my that's my jam. So if we have anybody to thank for lo-fi music, it'd be one hundred percent be him. And like, it sucks because like you know he's he's not with us anymore because he like actually like passed away in like a car accident like oh, wow. some years ago. But like his his music like still lives on, and like yeah. I listen to like a lot of his tracks like constantly. It's like I don't know. It, it's something about it like i have a particular like you know taste like if 
if a track like you know has like some way of starting or if it like you know goes a certain way then like i'm gonna like i'm gonna bump it like constantly yeah. and like a lot of that like a lot of aspects are like like drums like you know yeah. kind of like a high bpm kind of yeah, just yeah, like yeah. you know stuff to kind of get me like uh kind of get me excited absolutely yeah man well we'll chat after these questions i want to talk about music i want to talk about mm. how music plays a role in your canova play and just music sure. in general i we we don't take enough time on this show to talk yeah. about music and it's such a powerful piece of kanama yeah. uh, i think it drives so many players um alex mitchell fellow teammate soul pro wants to know if you had to choose one kanama that's been released from soul to play for the rest of your life oh my god what would it be you can't no new one you know it's yeah. just one dama oh my god um what sucks is that like all like the dhammas that i have like you know i i remember like what specific tricks were landed on that kendama and Ooh. i'm just like oh, the like i want to pick this one but like this one like has much more like emotional value um if i if i had to choose one um i think it'd be like i think it'd be the dom that like kind of like spiked my growth like the most and that'd be the kush liam the kush liam the okay. Kush Liam specifically, like you know, the Kush Liam, because like I, I put so I had a Kush Liam on on a bamboo can, and <laughs> dude, it was insane. It was crazy. I've hit so many. I hit so many like bangers on that dama. Yeah, and it it has like you know a bit of emotional aspect too, because I used that kanama in cup, and like that dama like got me like qualifying. I'm like I, I literally have to thank that dama for like you know being able for like to help me qualify and stuff was was that the same dama that you competed at nako 19 with um oh my god what are you uh, i'm pretty i i feel like i remember it it might not have been a bamboo ken but it might have been the liam tama i feel like most of you guys were competing with liam thomas that year because it was the newest drop from Seoul. yeah oh now that you brought up i i literally forgot what i what i played with um i'm trying to think Okay, it's gonna it's gonna bite me later, but like I, it's on the tip of my tongue. But okay, like, I, yeah, yeah. I think I remember. But, but it yeah. wasn't the Liam. You you don't think it was? Um, I don't think it was the Liam because like I was seshing the Liam hard, like you know, like at yeah. like when I wasn't competing because it was just like obviously like the new one up shape and like you know obviously like you know Liam Liam's own pro model side like right. Uh, but yeah, and and Chad confirmed it wasn't the cushion. It it could have been a regular Liam, but. It wasn't yeah. cushion because they didn't have cushion yet. Yeah, um, yeah. I I didn't I didn't use the Liam back then. Uh, I I I don't use um, like new Dons that came out like that day or like the day before. Cause, right. Uh, I I I used the the KD mod in twenty seventeen, like a totally fresh one. Bevel was like not broken in at all, <laughs> and that that kind of like screwed my competition placement because like you know my stalls weren't like on point and like I literally could have just like relied on yeah like my, my comp dama that i practiced with the entire yeah. time but you know i i just had it was just on an impulse so. <laughs> absolutely okay uh nc ncg.ken wants to know do you still need a ride to the sesh today is a it's a uh, timely question for yeah you. Uh, yes chad i i still need a ride to such day. Tez so, did not reply to me so yeah go go pick him up just yeah. go get your boy <laughs> <laughs> okay uh question here from chad your your boss boss man the company owner he wants to know what are you cooking yeah. for his birthday in three weeks happy early birthday chad covington oh okay you cooking him what uh, you're cooking me or are you making him something different i got now i want to know um i think it, it might be one of the things that like you know like i mentioned earlier but i obviously have to make it you know vegan friendly uh for yeah. him because he's vegan so like what i can do is like I, I can make the main dish and then i can you know cook the meat afterwards and separate the meat off to the side for the people that do want the meat and stuff like that so i think it i think it still might be um the the mapo tofu but if not that then uh it could be like you know one of my other like favorite like dishes like i could make um I can make like you know my my stir fried like curry beef and broccoli. I can make like I I just wanted to I, I want to make something that like you know just like he'll like 
and that the others will like, you know, and that'll uh, fulfill his uh, his vegan needs. So yeah, mm. I'm still still thinking of that. But we need we definitely need to get a rice cooker because rice cooker is essential. You so you're not a I I always cook my rice on the stove. I do it in a pot and I I do that. Wow, like- that that is insane. I I don't know how to how you do that. It's crazy. Let me tell you, it's super easy. You just take your cup okay. of, cup of rice, one cup of rice, and then two one and a uh-huh. half cups of water. Put that on the stove. Bring that to a boil. Maybe add a little salt in there if you want to. If you're afraid yeah. of it sticking, you can put like a little drop of olive oil or something in there. And then you bring that to a boil. The moment it hits boil, turn it down to like one on the stove. Put a lid on it and just let it sit. That's it. Wow, that's crazy. I don't know. I, it's weird because I've just like grown up with like a rice cooker like all my life. So I just like I'm just so used to dump, pour, <laughs> up, to, up to that line, and then look, it's done. Okay, so but the thing for me is like seriously, I I thought that I was legit because I did it on the stove, mm-hmm. and and then and then like you know some of my some of my Asian friends are like, why don't you just use a rice cooker? It was like because it's not <laughs> exactly. as authentic, and I'm like, it's I, I have to be authentic. I I'm trying to learn to be better, and they're. And they're like, dude, no, the real way to do it is just get a rice cooker. I'm like, really? You mean I'm doing it wrong by doing it on the stove? <laughs> I, I thought it was hilarious when, when I learned that. And I've just been stubborn. Now, rice cookers can be expensive. And my rice cooker is broken. Yeah. It doesn't switch to uh, the warm setting. So it just stays cooking the whole time. So I have to watch it. And it's like, if I use it, I have to be really particular about when yeah. I, when I, uh, you know pull it off okay, yeah okay, okay you i i don't generally put olive oil in it another guy named tristan come <laughs> on come on <laughs> but it helps if it if you don't want it to say you use vegetable coconut oil you name it i love making coconut rice that's that's my fave coconut rice okay coconut rice yeah, is the best. Nice. for curries like butter chicken or you do like a yeah. thai peanut curry oh, mm. yeah i love that it's so good so freaking good i love cooking I, oh. dude i love 100 i love cooking too I love it. Okay, uh, photos from Eli. Eli wants to know, what tricks and concepts are you working towards right now? Do you have a current dream trick or a past favorite dream trick unlock? Okay, wow, that's... So a lot A lot of my the ideas that like I've been saving have been, um, it's like the first time I'm saying this in public, but I've, I've been saving a lot of these like concepts for... Um, my seven year edit because I'm hitting seven years of Kanama this year. So I want that one, like that edit to be like, to go way harder than like my Mari vibe edit. So there's one that, that kind of like sticks out to me. So uh, do you know who Rudy is? Rudy Simpliciano? Uh, and, uh, is that Rudy underscore like Mastez? No. Uh, no, Rudy from, he was on the Sweets uh, homegrown team. No, Vegas. I don't. Local. I don't think okay. I do. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, you definitely need to uh, watch him if you have the chance. He's a fantastic player, like one of my main inspirations for Dom, too. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so um, one of the tricks that he showed me, and I was, like, I was like trying it for a bit. I'm like, yeah, this is – I think this is impossible. This is, like, crazy. So it's a um, new whirlwind, right? And then as it comes to spike, you immediately, like, push it and fast so it's it's all one instantaneous so whirl fast and then push fast stun fast. flick push oh. how yeah. do you even have enough time to do that in the air i have no clue no he, idea did he hit that trick or was it all conceptualized he he conceptualized it and like but he nobody has, said it nobody said it and i'm hoping to hoping to hit it and yeah, but I mean, if somebody else can hit it, hit it like before me, then that's just like you know, good for you. You've put it in public domain now, so yeah, the race <laughs> is on. You guys yeah. gotta, you know, Kelvin. Now, now you gotta. Whoever's listening to the review is gonna get up and start practicing that too. So you gotta, yeah. you gotta hustle your buns there. But I mean, like other other than that trick, like I, I think like the five tap long tap has kind of been like uh, my like that was like the main dream trick of mine. So, mm-hmm. like at, at the moment, like I have like smaller ones, but like I don't know, just just something about that one because like he he dared it to me, and it's just like it sticks out because it's like it's so tech, and like you know if if I like was able to pull it off, it'd be like amazing, like one mm-hmm. of like the highlights. Yeah, absolutely. But, okay, yeah. 
let's hit one more question and then let's talk music. I, I really want to dive into music because you love music, classical, anime, you yeah. name it. I want to kind of get sure. into your headspace there a bit. But ncg.ken also wants to know, what do you look for in a trick to be considered technical or creative? Like what is the, how do you know whether or not it's a tech trick or a creative trick in your book? Um, so like my definition can kind of like be different from like other people's definitions, but like how, what I consider tech is just something that, I wouldn't say like particularly awkward, but just like something kind of like out of like the norm. And this kind of goes like for mm -hmm. like creative too. Like, so, so it's like, if you, if you take something like juggle the spike, right? Juggle the spike is like totally normal, like, you know, standard trick, right? Yeah. But I, I've been messing with um, like juggle the spikes, but you control the Tama so that like it, um, it does like however many flips that you want. So I'm messing with like controlled, like one, two, three uh, juggles with like you know this with the tama flipping, flipping one two three yeah so so that kind of like you know that i see is tech so if you have like like a base trick like say like you know like like down spike and if you can like kind of like expand upon it in like uh like an out of the blue like you know out of like the normal sense way then i kind of mm. consider that tech and like also like um i kind of uh with like trick uh like, like trick combos or like just like single tricks if it's like super like kind of stuck in one place and like it, it's really hard to put like you know put this into terms but like um so yesterday like kevin was doing like this like insta like he he did this candle trick on me right he did mm -hmm. like a tap candle and he did like a candle flip uh flip like a full toss tap um like in and i was like yeah that's tech so it it's really hard like just like um i consider like tech to kind of be like you know like somewhat like uh like awkward too like really like yeah but so from what i've gathered is like for you it's like how much can you pack in a moment yeah, like you one, really yeah, look that. You really look at trying to fit more into one movement than to try and prolong the movement into mm -hmm. multiple steps. And and that kind of goes back to your playstyle change and your yeah. shift because you used to be all about the combos. You know, looking at something Wyatt Bray esque, which uh, Wyatt Bray is tech and combo focused. Like he he's yeah, insane. 100%. It's disgusting watching him play. It doesn't make any sense to me at all. But he's he's really consistent at doing combos over the period of forty five second clips. But you are like taking what is a normal trick, say like a juggle or a lunar flip and adding in like every little subtle movement that you possibly can to change the variation of what that thing is. And I love yeah. that. I love that Thank style you. of approaching you. a trick. And that for me, like I see that in like my appreciation for tricks. I really like that because I come from like a mountain biking BMX background. And one of my oh, favorite really? riders of all time is Brandon Semenuk. And he is an insanely good mountain bike rider, but he is all about adding in more things in a tight frame uh, than you could ever imagine possible. So instead of doing like a triple backflip, he looks mm -hmm. at doing one backflip while kicking his, like doing an, a one foot can can or knack knack while doing mm -hmm. a bar spin. And he's like adding in multiple things wow. into one trick uh, that is considered like a simpler trick and then just compounding other variants into that thing. So he, his riding style would be very comparable to how you play Kanon, yeah. which is insane. Yeah, no. You, you, yeah, you said it one your percent best. I was just like trying to find the right words, but like, uh, definitely like packing the most and in you into like a single moment is like what defines tech for me. And that, like, you know, that kind of like, um, kind of explains like how a lot of my tricks are because, uh, it's just like just that explosive one moment that kind of like, you know, instant shock that you get from just like that one like combo, like trick S type beat. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I think it's such a unique style and you have to be so precise in it to actually do it. And, and I think it goes underappreciated by a lot of people because so many people don't even understand what's happening in that moment yeah. because it can be so quick and so subtle and to understand the precision that you need to have to be able to do all three things in the span yeah. of that one lunar flip is insane. Absolutely. So yeah. And that's why like I, I try to push tech as much as, as much as possible just cause like, you know, it's just, it's such a, it's a really underrated 
trick category right now and not a lot of people are kind of like uh, like more people um have started delving into it back like since like back then but it's still such like you know an underrated like um underrated category mm -hmm. I, l I really like what kevin said down in the chat he yeah. says taking a regular 100%. move or a simple move and making it difficult is what i think tech is uh, yeah. i think that's a great way of putting it and i think that that is the approach of, of tech is like taking something that everybody else sees as simple and making it hard by adding something or by complicating it in some manner or some shape i yeah. i think that's the best way to put it i love that yeah 100 super simple statement thank you kevin for that definition <laughs> thank you thank you to kevin for waking up because he told me yesterday that he wasn't going to tune in because he wanted to sleep in today so hey shout out shout out to the kev dog um yeah. so okay let's dive into a little bit of conversation here about music uh you played violin for a bunch of years music played a huge role in your life you're into classical you're into all these things give me like kelvin wong and music give me that narrative yeah so as much as I listen to like rap and other genres of music, like you know, it's literally half and half. Half is classical music, half is like, you know, whatever, whatever other genres that I listen to. And it, it could literally be um, how I'm feeling that day. Like I have like pieces that I listen to when I'm feeling like, you know, angsty, anxious. I have pieces that I listen to when I'm like feeling like really happy and stuff like that. So it's something about like, classical music and like coming from a background of like being able to play classical music it's like such a fantastic form of like expression you're just like you're pouring like all your heart and soul into like this like one piece and it's it's something about it and like you know it's w what makes me like um continue to play violin to this day because it's just it's it's something about it man i'm telling you just like you know if you play an instrument like if anybody, anybody who like in the chat plays an instrument, like, you know what I mean? But just like being, being able to like express yourself in like, like musically, musically, like sonically, it's just mm -hmm. like, it's like a whole other like playing field. It, yeah. It's crazy. Did, do you play other instruments outside of violin or is that the only one that you play? I actually, I don't know if you can see. Yeah. I actually got into uh bass. Oh, sick. like, you know, uh a few months ago because me and my homies like we wanted to start a band and hopefully that's <laughs> still kind of going yeah. on but um what's funny is that so violin you know you kind of know violin as like being like the forefront of like melody and stuff like sure. that, right but i kind of wanted to like change up my mind state and like try my hand at bass because bass is like you know like the fact so here's like the melody and like here you have like the foundation like you have like the tempo you have like the groove mm -hmm. and like that's kind of what attracted me to bass because like i kind of wanted to delve into a different you know playing style and like, mm -hmm. mentality like while i play because like being like the foundation is kind of weird after being like you know like the forefront of like the piece for so long so yeah mm -hmm. what role does music play in your life like is it is it something for you to express yourself is it something that is therapeutic for you like how how do you see music playing a role in your life today it's it's all those things honestly like um like i don't know it's weird because like whenever i'd be like cooking i'd be walking down the street like i'm always like humming some sort of tune that's like in my head and so like music is always on my mind like there's never a moment where like i'm not like you know like i don't have a theme or just like humming something that i heard earlier so mm. music like that um that therapeutic aspect too like if i'm just having like a rough day i'll just put on like some like some song that i've been listening to lately and just like you know lay down on my bed and just like you know just chill kind of just like it, it gets me in a different mm -hmm. like zone and just kind of like makes everything feel a bit better and it also helps me sleep too like i don't go to sleep without listening to like one piece of like classical music before i go to sleep so I have like a whole bunch of, I have a whole bunch of like, uh, pieces that, you know, I put on and then like most of the time I fall asleep, uh, like, you know, like as the piece is ending or like in the middle yeah. of the piece, depending how tired I am. So yeah, that's, that's how music is in my life. Honestly. That's super cool. Huh? Uh, are you, are you the type of person that explores a lot of different music and is always looking for new stuff or do you keep listening to the same things over and over and over again. Cause I'm the latter. I listen, I have like my one playlist and my like small selection of music that I really like. And I just, I just mess with that. 
Uh, it honestly, it honestly depends on like how I'm feeling like that day. Cause like I, I could be like in someone's car and they have uh like a song playing and I'm like, hold on, replay that. Let me, let me hear that like again. Mm-hmm. So like I, so I can you know, I'm down to like uh always find out new music that way. Uh, but uh, most of the time I just have like the same like 10 20 songs that i listen to so mm-hmm. it really just depends on how i'm feeling that day what, what's your all-time favorite song if you have one classical oh or rapper oh my or, god okay okay I'll, ma- I'll make it a little easier for you okay. <laughs> what what are like a few favorites that you think everybody should listen to um i think okay so for classic music it's easier because like you know there's not a lot out there but um definitely a lot of it is like you know violence centered so uh if you're just starting to get into uh like violin music definitely listen to um tchaikovsky violin concerto uh brahms violin concerto mendelssohn violin concerto those are like you know a lot of uh really easily listenable ones and then from there you kind of just like delve into deeper like Mm -hmm. uh, categories like quartets trios I'm, i'm listening to um like i've been uh listening to this uh piano trio in a minor with a violin cello and piano from tchaikovsky and it's just like it's something about that piece it's like it's Mm -hmm. so nice and it's in the key of a minor a minor is like your relatively like Mm -hmm. sad sounding key yeah i love a minor yeah a minor is dope it's a cool key (laughs) but yeah so (laughs) it's like nerding out in the chat yo no i'm a i'm a g sharp kind of guy yeah (laughs) i love i love a solid f you know (laughs) <laughs> so so um definitely like th- those are like my um uh, my favorite piece oh okay i have to mention like um there's this one uh quartet uh quintet from dvorak it's the american quintet in e flat major it's with two violins two violas and a cello and i um i actually was supposed to perform like the last movement of it for um like graduation or like for like yeah. my last concert my, my like junior year orchestra concert but COVID hit so that kind of like mm. that kind of sucks but definitely listen to that one that one's like really like it's really nice yeah yeah okay so do you do you see in music like when you visualize things do you see things with music playing around because because I, I do and it's weird man I like play kendama and as I'm mm-hmm. playing kendama I'm like visualizing music alongside what i'm doing and i'm not even that musical of a person but like i can imagine the beat playing along with what i'm doing and what i'm hitting i'm very flow oriented in the way that i try to play generally like when i'm not filming a trick and i'm always like humming in my head a soundtrack to whatever i'm playing and i just like visualize that are you are you like that or, or not at all is it separate um so like after like playing an instrument for like uh like so many years it like i've kind of I've kind of been able to like pick up like certain aspects of you know soundtracks and like Kevin can definitely relate to this too. So like if if there's a song with like a bass line, like I listen into that bass line, like oh this is a funky bass line. Mm. Or if like you know there's like this like little like rhythm that kind of like sticks out to me, I'm gonna be like you know dude oh my god that little like you know that's so mm. sick. So like just I I kind of like pinpoint little like details here and there like that I find like really like interesting in music and that's mm-hmm. like you know that's what I listen for and that's like you know I kind of adapt that into my play too because I yeah. try to take like the most like obscure like concept that like people haven't like you know really uh expanded upon and kind of like blow it out of proportion like I try to like squeeze as much out of it as as I can yeah in some ways your your trick style is similar to like a classical piece in the way that mm-hmm you know, perceptually from the outside, it may look like it's a simple trick, say like a lunar flip, but behind the scenes, it's a very technical, you know, piece of art that's playing with all the subtleties and the, and the, the little uptones and down, and it's all being constructed by the conductor so that Mm -hmm. you see a visually aesthetic experience. But behind that is just layers and layers of complexity. Yeah. And also like, um, so like, I, I think I, like, I'm able to read sheet music really good. So, I'm able to like somewhat have like a, a grasp of what like the rhythm is. So I'm able to s- kind of s- like imagine like what the sheet music would yeah. look like for that, like for uh, like whatever I'm listening to. So yeah. yeah. That's crazy. Uh, you ever watch the movie Whiplash? 
Yeah. Dude, what did, you, what did you think watch. of that movie? I loved it. It, it was super intense. It, it was crazy. I, I love Whiplash. Re- a really great, really great movie. Such a good movie. Have you have you seen other uh, musically like focused films like uh, Sound of Metal? I just watched that one recently. Uh, no, I. If anything, I've seen more uh, musical anime. Okay, yeah, for yeah, sure. That, that's. Uh, but yeah, I haven't really seen a lot of like musical uh, movies. There's not a heck ton of them. At least there's not a ton of them in like mainstream film. Uh, Whiplash mm-hmm. obviously was a big one that came out recently. A really crazy uh, movie. Loved it. J.K. Simmons knocked it out of the park with his acting. Very intense movie. Very, very intense. Um, yeah, but Sound of Metal. Different. Sound of Metal was super interesting because it goes through like like a rock drummer who loses his hearing. And then like mm-hmm. it, it's less about the music and more about like the psychology of like him like learning to accept where he's at. And yeah. anyway, great movie too. Hard, hard to watch movie. Anyways, uh, I'll give that one a try. Yeah. Yeah. Or any any other films or movies that musically inspire you, or in general that you'd want to hit on in, in the music sphere. If I if I have um, so I wasn't like you know, uh, this one anime really spiked my love for um, classical music, and so that anime, if like if you ever get a chance, like please watch this anime because it's really it's fantastic like that it's part of my top five too it's called um your line april and okay. it's it's like you know uh it's really like you know violin and piano based and just like it, it's a it's a romance anime I'll, I'll say that right now but it's just like the story of like how like the two main characters like you know kind of build a relationship it's like mm-hmm. it's really beautiful and it, it, yeah i cried at the end and you know it's i'm not afraid to admit that it's hey actually, no own that yeah own the tears dude i, yeah. I love it absolutely yeah, it's, i'll, I'll it's check a it really out great, yeah it's I'll a really to... great anime and i've like you know i found a lot of like the pieces that like i still listen to this day from that anime so it's yeah it's really good that's awesome hey well kelvin we'll we'll start wrapping it up here in a bit but i i want to know you know kind of before we really conclude this episode what what's next mm-hmm. for you where do you want to see yourself in the kanama world and in life in the next two years you're obviously i mean we talked about it at the beginning you want to go into mm-hmm. graphic design and yeah. go into that sphere uh talk to me a little bit about the next two years of kelvin wong's life and what do you want <sighs> ideally i i'm not afraid to say this right now but like you know i'm I'm definitely not like a confident person and I definitely want to work on that mm. as like, in, as the years go on, it's, it's a really like, you know, hard concept for me to grasp. So ideally I want to work on like my con- Okay. So <laughs> all good. I do. Yeah. Ideally. I want to, um, yeah, I want to like be more confident in myself. And obviously, like, pro is, like, a lot of, um, takes up a lot of my time, my mental time. So, like, be, uh, being pro, that's obviously on the on the radar within, like, a year or so. So, hopefully that mm-hmm. happens. Um, other than that, just, like, you know, I really want to, one of the big things on my mind is I really want to uh, grow the Kanama community here in Vegas again. I really want to kind of like get it back to the point where it was like when I started, it, it's going to be hard, but you know, I think, you know, with the help of like Kevin and like other people in the community, we can definitely get back to where it was, but it's, it's picking yeah. up for sure. And you guys have a, a group of very active players there and all yeah. it takes is to just start inspiring the new generation uh, of, of players and finding a few of them to start getting into it. Like, I don't know how you can do it, but, but that that's all it'll take. Yeah, dude, one hundred percent. So yeah, those uh, those are definitely the the top three that I hope you know. Kind of, I'm manifesting it right now. So you know, hopefully it happens. But I, obviously, top of my list is pro. So I'm constantly working towards that. So that's yeah. awesome. That's so sick. Hey, well, Kelvin, thank you so much for coming on here today. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your story, diving into it. We talked a lot about a lot of different things. Jumped around from cooking to anime. Mm-hmm. Man, we went all over the place and I love it. And it was really interesting to hear your approach to how you approach tricks and breaking things down. And I love your perspective on a competing and trick composition. Are you still still getting more phone calls? Yeah, no. (laughs) No, no, no. Tell them to hang up. Yeah. Dude, Dude, no, seriously, though, think. Oh, go go ahead. You you say some words. (laughs) Okay. Dude, I just want to say thank you so much for having me on because, like, 
I don't, I don't really have like, I don't really have a lot of chances to talk about how, you know, like when I'm thinking a lot, like I, a lot of like the time, you know, I usually just have like these conversations when I'm homing out with people, whether it's at like a Dom event or like, you know, with like someone to hang out with. So just being able to express myself in this way, is really like, you know, refreshing. And totally. Like, I'm so thankful. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, and it's great. You know, I've seen the benefit a both personally for the individuals that have been on the review and for the community, you know, these conversations humanize the, the economic community for a lot of people and begin to, to show the narrative behind the tricks of the people that are in there and the types of mindsets that people bring into Kanama and hearing your mindset of how you approach the game and how you click with doing tricks is actually so helpful. I think for the, the, you know, the new numbers of people that will listen to this episode that will yeah. help them to see a different way of how they can approach Kanama, but more than that, how they can approach life. Cause at the end of the day, you know, this podcast, yeah, hopefully you, you learn to play Kanama better and you become a better Kanama player, but more than that, that you have gained a broader perspective on life in, in general and can grow that way. So that's, that's the ultimate hope. And dude, yeah. you, you killed it. I would love having you on here and I'm stoked to see your journey in the next two years. I want to see what hey, happens when you, you go to college. <laughs> I want to see, dude, I want to see the college clips rolling out. Dude, honestly. And just like, you know, I, I hope that just like whatever I said within like the past, like, you know, we've been rocking time, two hours. Dang. That's crazy. Yeah. Like however much time that I've been like, you know, I mean like whatever I've said within like the past two hours, hopefully, you know, like somebody can find like solace in what I've said or like, you know, get inspired by like what I said. Cause I really want to like help, people out i really want to kind of like spread the game more especially like here in vegas so mm. yeah that's like the main goal definitely 100 preach it man preach it hey well calvin thank you so much for jumping on here and we are rooting for you we're, we're gonna thank we're you. gonna start so tagging much. you in all of souls post kelvin for pro kelvin for pro. <laughs> dude thank we're, you so much we're gonna help that manifest uh come come to come to life here soon kelvin thank you again for jumping on here dude, and thanks so much adam we will see you soon. Uh, is there, I always like to leave it to you to say the final mm -hmm. words. Is there anything you'd like to wrap, wrap up or speak into the community through this platform? Um, just, just play to play, man. Just like, you know, to think about like how you started Kanama back then and, you know, just like dig back into to your roots and just, you know, just play to play, just like, always be progressing as much as possible no matter how fast or how slow you may be it's progression so you know i hope that you guys find you know what you're looking for in life and yeah dude love it hey well if you are still listening to the episode this far in and if you have enjoyed what you've heard definitely go check out the patreon if you want to support the review it's five dollars a month and that gives you behind the scenes access to everything that's going on behind the review so Anyways, all that to say, thank you again, Kelvin, and we will see you guys next Dude, week with another so interview here. And we're coming up on the one-year anniversary, and we've got some special things coming that I, I'm going to tell the Patreon about soon, but there's some really exciting stuff happening that I can't wait I can't to wait. It's going to be good. Dude. Peace out, Kelvin, and we will see you soon. Thank you so much, Adam. Have a good day, dude.